OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Hello, how are you keeping out there? OTBM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Mayo's Nathan Murphy, good morning. Hey Shane. And Cork's Colin Buhig, very good morning. Good morning Shane, good morning Nathan. Happy hump day, how are things? Keeping well? How are you? Uh, not too bad. Uh, Champions League was back last night, which brought a sense of normality back to our lives, I think. Mm-hmm. Sort of snuck up on me, to be Did honest. Did actually, yeah, I wasn't expecting it. I think the um, fact that Arsenal Manchester City is on tonight and you know it's the biggest game the most important game of the season and then you've uh, traditionally that has never been allowed to have such a big Premier League game on the same night as the Champions League and uh, then lo and behold it turns out you know Spurs are getting beaten again <sighs> plus a change lads it was Tottenham last night they, yeah they were they were decent it was kind of one of those games that there were chances half chances Fraser Forster save that, that needs a mention they obviously scored a goal off the back of it Brahim Diaz heads in the rebound but I mean for Tottenham it's not a terrible result is it? Take them back to North London and, and, and do them there. I think Tottenham will be pretty pleased with that considering the team that they put out last night. Yeah. Uh, no Hoiberg through suspension like that midfield of Winks and Saar uh, I was watching Paris Saint-Germain but uh, looking at the highlights and everything I've read was that they did relatively well Yeah. but this is Tottenham at the moment there's just a total lack of consistency they are at their best a brilliant counter-attacking team like a really brilliant counter-attacking team but defensively they just look too much of a shambles for an Antonio Conte side at the moment and probably epitomised by Christian Romero who you know I would have in the very top tier of centre-backs in the Premier League Mm. but the last three or four games and it could well be a World Cup hangover has just looked slightly off a little bit late to every challenge terrible terrible tackle he got booked for last night that could easily uh, have done serious damage to the AC player that mm. could have got him sent off so I'm got sent off a few weeks ago uh, for Tottenham against Manchester City so there's something just not happening for them at the moment but Spurs under Conte have always had these runs of nothingness where they don't score many goals they don't create any chances and next thing they'll win 5 out of 6 <laughs> Now, they're still waiting for that sort of run of winning five out of six. Maybe it comes at the right time over the next few weeks. They're still in the mix for a top four. I still think at home, you know, packed house at Tottenham Stadium against the average AC Milan side. Which they are. They'll feel that they should have enough to win that. Yeah. They, uh, I can't get used to calling it the Stadio Giuseppe Miazza. I think it's the San Siro. Like, getting knocked down soon as well, which is which is sad. You heard the atmosphere probably through the television last night and it was it was buzzing when, when AC got, got their goal, obviously, but... Uh, it's one of the stadiums I've never visited. That's definitely been on the list. Mm. Like, you got to get. Never to been to Italy, so I definitely haven't been to. You've never been to Italy. Well, he, never I was been only there in two thousand and five skiing. John Duggan's never been to Italy either. No, it's, I think it's pretty much the only European country I've never been to. I was going to say you've I don't done know why. Fair bit of commentary, but I the definitely why? would like to. I, I, it's just it's just never happened for me. My Italian adventure. Can I these days? Can I admit something? Right, I'm going to admit something. I, 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 you know what? I'm gonna never been to Donegal. No, 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 no. Of course I've been to Donegal. Right. So, before the match last night, so I watched the game at 8 o'clock with my friends, uh, the AC Milan Spurs game. But um, three of us in the house, we decided, how, what can we do to, to mark Valentine's Day, but in a kind of a protesting kind of way? Do you know, we're not going to sit down and watch a rom-com and be all soppy with each other, but we're going to just sit there and, and the three of us just enjoy each other's company. So, we ordered an Indian, got a bit of food delivered. Uh, we decided we put on a movie that that completely is the antithesis of Valentine's Day, and I said to the lads, no, "Don't don't judge me when I say this, okay? Because I'm, I'm I'm opening up to you, lads." I said, "I've never seen The Godfather," which which left the room a little bit uh, in shock. So we turned on The Godfather with five half five just to to squeeze it in before the match. So last night I watched The Godfather for the first time. Of course, I get the references, you know, sleeping with the fishes and. Mm. Give him an offer he can't refuse. I, I knew all the references, but I, but I hadn't put it all together. Do you know what I've never heard? I've never heard of someone who watched The Godfather for the first time at five o'clock in the day. Yeah. Well, you see, that's very I done the college maths. student-y, isn't this? Yeah. I done like, the maths. This was what I was thinking when I came in here today because the air conditioning is broken and the fact we're sitting so close together. <laughs> the this tension room in here smells is a bit insane. like my college apartment, but that is the most 
I'm back in college. I have no commitments in life whatsoever. I'm going to sit down and watch The Godfather. See, see, I haven't seen it in about 25 years, so it's that thing where, and I'm not one of these people who has a good memory for lines from movies yeah, or fair. Uh, very precise detail. So I thought you'd be more disgusted lost. by that, so I, I'm, I'm quite relieved. I actually was expecting a, a worse reaction. I haven't seen a lot of obvious things, don't worry. I never judge. Oh, really? Like the Wire, The Sopranos. Yeah, 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 fair. Gladiator. Never seen any oh, of them. Gladiator. Never seen any of them. I think The Gladiator was on one time in the background at a party, and that was it. But the, uh, the Godfather, oh, uh, shit <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was two in the morning. I had someone had it. Um, the Godfather, Al Pacino was such a lovely, softly spoken actor. Yes. And then became this completely different person. He had this air about the 80s him. onwards. But even but, in The Godfather, he transforms into a different person during it. Uh, yeah. Mostly, yeah, definitely in number two. Right. Have you seen no two? Spoiler. <laughs> no, 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 I haven't <laughs> seen two yet. I've, I've heard two is very good. Two is as good, possibly better. <laughs> Is three three supposed to be not as well? Good. Two is where De Niro pops up, right? But then you lose Brando. So. There's a there's your five o'clock this evening. Yeah, well, I knew Brando was gone because Don Corleone started about half four. You'll that's get Arsenal, right. Manchester City, and straight afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe that's a good, that's a good idea. Very sad Valentine's Day. It's got to be said. It, it was man about town like you, Shane. I th- would have thought there was a ah, bit of demand. Not at all. No, Jesus, no. The God- Buhig, There was a bit of romance in the Buhig household. That's a newly married. <laughs> there was, yeah, definitely. Uh, there was. Um, Oh, when are KBC even Ireland? Oh, shit. we need to sort that out. Yeah, yeah that was the yeah. night. Yeah, really. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Did you see Marcus Rashford's Instagram post last night? No. Oh my word, he put up this video of like I mean his entire gaff was like he was playing sultry music. The gaff was covered in in rose. Like I mean, when I say covered, I mean like he paid was, someone to come in and do up his gaff. Of course he did. Yeah, essentially, and he could well afford it, Marcus Rashford. But uh, yeah, Instagram was not a place for any singletons last night. You're just like, are you all right? No, no. Oh, I'm grand. Walking through town, looking at all the uh, confused uh, men buying buying flowers. Every second person had flowers on the streets of Dublin last night. I'm sure you two lads were, were two of them, but I just uh, we went home and felt sick. Do you still do Valentine's Day? Well, Valentine's Day happens whether I do it or not. Do you do so. it? Do you celebrate it? <laughs> do you, do you mark it? Some course, people don't yes. celebrate major do holidays. Not? Do you celebrate Valentine's yeah, Day? Yeah, do you? Do you? Why wouldn't I? Well, I, we asked Jared this very question yesterday and he was almost offended at the notion of celebrating it for such a long marriage. But I think, you know, Jared's Come softer on. than he lets on. He you is, know? of course. He's, he's hard not, exterior is easy to crack after. He's not going to admit day. it, like, out loud, to be honest. Well, that, like, Nathan was uh, able to admit it, which is a great sign. Yeah, yeah. openness. You you weren't watching Spurs, Nathan. You, were, you decided... Oh, I watched PSG Paris Saint-Germain, uh, PSG Bayern. Um, the uh, 10-year-old has the remote control in our house and it's all about PSG. Oh, really? Oh, absolutely. A PSG fan. Yes. Or a Messi fan. Well, a, me- uh, a Messi fan uh, was a Genie Wijnaldum fan, so wherever Genie went, he went. Now, Genie's obviously gone on uh, to not so greater things um, and a devastating injury at Roma, but mm. yeah, there's still a lot of love there for um, Paris Saint Germain, uh, which they didn't, uh, didn't pay back on Valentine's Day from last night. It was absolutely atrocious. They were, you, yet again, you watch Paris Saint Germain and think, how has this squad been assembled at mm. such expense? to be so poor. Now, Mbappe was injured and they got a lot better when he came on for the last 25 minutes yeah. and suddenly there was a bit of pace or attack. But the first hour, they barely, if ever, threatened inside the final third. They couldn't get Neymar and Messi into the game at all. Uh, Neymar looks like his legs are gone completely. Right. Every time he gets it, he's thrown himself to the ground, not in a diving way, in a, I can't do anything else except just try and draw a foul out of somebody. Mm. Uh, and... You do look at the quality behind that again and go, like it's such a lopsided team. They had a 16 year old playing last night. Yeah. Youngest ever player to play and start in the knockout stages. Uh, Warren Zaire Emery, 16 years of age. Did okay, but Byron were far and away the better team. Uh, really should have won um, convincingly. Now, there was a very tight call at the end uh, for an offside Side, yeah. for Mbappe, but Byron would have wanted to be sort of 2 3 0 up, I think. Such was their dominance in the game. Completely controlled it. Uh, lacked probably a little bit as well in front of goal. But much like the game last night, these matches are all about the second legs. It's don't get battered in the first leg. Yeah. Keep yourself alive Stand until the high. second leg. And it felt like that with Bayern. They were so superior to Paris Saint-Germain, but almost were afraid to go and fully commit to it mm. in case they got stung. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard not to watch Paris Saint-Germain. They've, they've lost five games already this year alone so they're not having it all their own way domestically mm. there's no rhythm there and maybe maybe Mbappe being fully fit in a couple of weeks time 
changed it. You would have to think so. He's arguably the best player in the world right now, and he and did change it in the last 20 minutes. But I, I you cannot see Paris Saint Germain winning the Champions League this year. No. Neymar confirming a dressing room bust up as well with Marcinos and the sporting director after the defeat to Monaco at the weekend. It was not like rosy, but it, it never felt that anything was really rosy at PSG. Yeah, and they just never. somehow, despite themselves, kind of well. expect that, don't you? Uh, like they got to the 2020 Champions League final, you'd forget that, you know, last yeah. by the odd goal to Bayern. Yeah, and like they were that close to doing what Neymar always wanted to do. And had he won that Champions Holman League, scored the goal then as well. He did. And that so could have been a different thing. Kings, so you, you just expect a PSG battle job in the knockout stages. To be fair, of the Champions League, I know you say they got to the final a couple of years ago. They, no, the, they, they actually did. Oh, they did. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know they did. You sit here and claim that they got to the final. I don't know if that I happened. I don't, I, don't know. Know. I don't know. Uh, Kingsley come and not celebrating. What like he's in Paris? I suppose he's a Paris boy. Uh, do you understand it or are you, you're like ah just celebrate lad no you need to be near in testimonial level to not celebrate yeah. it happened at the weekend Emerson Palmieri scored for West Ham against Chelsea mm. and it was only when he didn't celebrate oh yeah, oh, yeah he played for Chelsea yeah come on so no. you were you, there's Chelsea supporters at that match going now I know he, I think he has a Champions League medal yeah. uh, he was involved in the squad uh, that night but I think you have to celebrate don't you like also you're Emerson Palmieri you never score yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, let 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 the, let the emotions out. Don't pleasure denial is not a is not a, th- a thing to engage in. I think it was good marketing by Emerson. There's the line. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was good marketing by Emerson because he uh, probably is aware that people definitely forgot that he played for Chelsea. So it's like yeah, my yeah. celebration here would inform everyone that I used to play for this club. Champions League winner. Yeah. yeah. I wonder what he was doing. Um, Nathan, you were or you have been watching the new Netflix golf. Doc, which is out today, full full swing, full swing. Yeah, uh, I don't know if all eight episodes are out today or if just it's the first episode week. and it's week by week. But yeah, I've watched all eight episodes. What what's the review? It's grand in that most Irish way of describing something as grand, and it's a semi insulting. But uh, the problem with, and I think you probably felt the same with the tennis documentary, yeah. is w- who are they trying to appeal to with this? So I love my golf. I will watch nerdishly as much golf as I can every single week and I found it a bit dull there's little nuggets and behind the scene bits that you go I never knew that happened so they're inside the clubhouse at Augusta at a stage I'm like oh, I never knew that was a bit of the layout or they're there at lunch and Rory and Ram are sitting together on a couple of occasions like I wouldn't have known that Rory and Ram were quite that close yeah, yeah. even the sense at times of Rory being the alpha in the room every time when they're sitting at lunch and players are almost afraid and is he, yeah. can they sit absolutely he is but as to how it would attract a new audience I'm I'm really not sure the way it works is very again it's a tried and tested formula that that worked brilliantly for Drive to Survive but yeah. it doesn't work for other sports where they focus on one, one and a half players per episode. episode. You're so not the target audience one. still then. But I don't know what the target audience is. Like, I was sitting down last week to watch the first episode of my wife and she was asleep after about half an hour. Like, there was, there's almost too much golf in it in a way, but it's not given enough context. So there's too many shots shown. It's obviously edited brilliantly. So it just so happens they end up following all the major winners. Right. But obviously what they're doing is they're picking them up on the Friday or Saturday of the tournament and then yeah. talking to them afterwards, editing in as if it's before the tournament. Like, golf has a perception problem anyways. not helped when the opening shot is Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth on a private jet betting each other $1,000 if one of them can guess a card from a pack of cards. Oh, my word. So there are interesting parts to it. Uh, there's some of the lesser known guys, the guy Joel Damon, who's a regular PGA Tour guy, he's a very interesting backstory. He had cancer about a decade ago. His mother died when he was very young. No great confidence in himself. He's a very interesting background. Tony Finau, you know, really came from very little, has a half a dozen kids who he brings out and tour with him the whole time. He's in yeah? the best form of his career. His story is is quite interesting. Brooks Kepka, again, in a very superficial way, was quite probably a bit more fascinating than I would have expected in that he's in a real struggle with his game at the moment Mm -hmm. and like there was the real juxtaposition of he's sitting in this huge mansion he's about to get married and his wife-to-be is basically showing him all her various different wedding outfits and he's sitting there in this giant house sort of totally disinterested thinking about his swing and like barely acknowledging and all he's thinking about is how his game is in bits like Liv is going on in the background Mm -hmm. but while there's plenty of sort of talk about it there's not no focus a on a huge amount of new detail and it all builds up to Rory I kind of kept watching because I wanted to see 
uh, Connor Sketches put out a piece yesterday. Yeah, but, and, um, I'm not sure if Connor's actually seen it, but it's so close to actually what happens yeah, in it right. where they have Tiger come in and go, hi, Tiger Woods, and that's the only thing you see. And it's like that. You see like two seconds of Tiger. But Rory's in each episode for about five seconds. Yeah. But then the last episode is all about Rory. And there are some bits in that as to say behind the scenes on Liv and his influence. Now, he, he said last week that he was his agreement, he initially wasn't going to take part. His agreement was basically, I will talk to you at tournaments, but there's nothing about my family. You're not yeah, coming right. into my house. Any of that. So you see a, a couple of conversations. There's one bit that is probably the most revealing part of the entire piece where he's getting a massage in a room where five or six of the golfers are getting a massage and they're talking about American football and Josh Allen comes up and one of the other players goes, oh, Josh Allen's a Phil guy. And uh, Rory just roars out. You know, Mickelson. Oh, right. And uh, they all start laughing. And uh, it's, <laughs> I bet you they'll leave that in. Yeah. Which yeah. was just... You, uh, uh, you've illustrated about four or five different bits that's but interesting is, there. Like, but each of these uh, episodes are good. each of these episodes are forty five minutes long, and there's eight episodes. So it's like it's passable. As I said, I think there's an, there's enough that if you love your golf, you'll sit and you'll watch it and mm. you'll Absolutely learn a couple of little bits and pieces. But I totally understand expectations the, are way too high for these things now. Well, I totally understand with the drivers five people try to turn this into a franchise. Mm. It makes yeah, complete yeah. sense to do that. And oh, I yeah. was I was extremely excited for the tennis version, just as Nathan was for the golf version. And listening to you talk about the golf one there, the tennis one is very similar. So in the tennis Your one... Your reaction was similar, in fact. Very, because I was really... And I was like... Uh, and then in the first episode, they just do Nick Kyrgios, which is understandable. Mm. But the problem is, in the tennis one, they were without the seven most famous players in the world. Mm. And in my book, Kyrgios is the eighth most famous, so they had to go with him. And a bit like the Rory and Tiger examples there, was like Rafa Nadal and Djokovic were seen as these almost mythical figures who wouldn't engage directly, but yeah. they were always there. They're always present. Like the, 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 I you also know, thought the, the Curios episode. It didn't feel like a very fair reflection on him. He came across as well, firstly quite dull, which maybe he is behind the bravado. There was no great sense of him being the bad guy. Like there's bits again like this where he's sitting at dinner with his family, where you're kind of looking at the dynamic and probably reading way too much into it. Mm. But the problem both of these have compared to Drive to Survive, Drive to Survive wasn't built around the drivers. There was bits and pieces of the drivers, like it was Gunther, it was the third parties, it was the conversation sort of off the record between people who weren't actually competing. Yeah, yeah. I sort of thought in golf maybe there'd be somebody on the PGA Tour who'd become a star out of this, or an agent, or somebody who was revealing. But they also have that problem, as in the tennis of talking head of which I would love to be one of those talking heads getting paid massive amounts oh, of money to sit there and class. go so they come on they go so in golf it's four rounds of 18 holes 72 holes and halfway through there's a cut 36 holes they get rid of half the field and those guys don't get paid and that's failure for those guys. They this do, is his audition. <laughs> they this do, is your audition for the next series. But do, so it's explaining what golf is. They do the same in tennis. They explain the sets. Incorrectly explain what, them as well. Do you want to audition it, for Totally your incorrectly explain them. No, because that's the other thing as well. With the golf thing, they really ham it up, right? With the tennis one, it's very... Yeah. Kind of explained in a very kind of objective way. But they're also saying it's the first to six in every set but that's not always the case like, oh, it's you true. have to win by two uh, if you're explaining you're losing you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's they don't even do it properly you know, you, you, you know what I mean it just goes to a tie break they never explain the fact that if it's 5 all 6-5 ain't going to yeah, do it yeah. but, and then, so they're actually going to this new audience So who, a bit like Nathan like who are they actually going to what did you want from the golf one what did you go in with the expectations I, I had very low expectations of us uh, I, I sort of thought it might end up a little bit like this because yeah. there's no benefit to the players to be overly revealing. Like, and golf is appealing to a white male, unbelievably corporate audience. How much money are they getting for doing it, though? It's a, it's a clean cut image kind of sport. So, why would you mm. go deeper than that? Well, you look at, and my expectations for the Six Nations one are unbelievably low to start with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but based on this and the fact that we're already hearing this, you know, the various different organizations aren't happy with the amount, they're only getting, what, 100 grand? Yeah. Each rugby organization out of this, Rory McIlroy. Why would you? Rory is the Don Vito Corleone of it. <laughs> Just gonna well, throw in a few Rory, references there. Rory, um, that was the Godfather. Rory said it hadn't, uh, wasn't initially going to take part, but was convinced that this wouldn't make sense, and it really wouldn't make sense right. if Rory wasn't even there at the end. And Main it sort character. of ties it up nicely. But for Drive Five, there was no expectation, and then suddenly people are like, "This is absolutely incredible." Yeah, the, the, this is the, like, and that's oh, where the, the drive to survive out now as well, isn't it? Suffered. Yeah, yeah, it's out next week. But even Drive to Survive, when you so again, that's those first couple of series were exceptional and then it 
tied in couldn't have tied in better with the fact that you get the greatest one of the greatest endings to the World Drivers Championship of all time mm. but that series of Drivers Survive then about that season is quite dull yeah the first you're waiting the yeah. you're waiting for what really happened behind the scenes and it just never comes no it's no insight it's no background insight at least from all of this we have one more uh, fan now of tennis because Jojo started watching uh, Breakpoint oh, yes. got See, into that, it you well, know? That's, that's, that's what, what you want yeah. so if anything that's a success yeah. Jojo well, nodding away I would, the way, I would say with the golf one so Shane Lowry did a video for the European tour down in Clara and sort of given his background that is a far more interesting that was very good yeah. insight and again Shane gave what he wanted to give in that like mm. there's there's no part of this that's appearing on air that no people haven't agreed to yeah. that's true that's fair. Lads, I, I have a big fear here why? That we're not going to get time uh, to do what we want to do. Well, let's we, go for it. Yeah, let's do it for that. Uh, so we, we're going to talk more Spurs, of course. We've we've Martin Lipton on the way from 8 o'clock. We've we have Keith Wood from, from 20 past the 8, Virtual and Sandy with John Duggan. We're going to do Kathleen's uh, women's national team power rankings, which uh, has kept her awake all night. And Kevin Moran, the former water returner, will join us as well from, from 10 past 9. But, uh, Colin, you mentioned it. So a couple of weeks ago, was it last week? Or the week last before? Week. Last week. Myself and yourself picked our Manchester United Premier League era top 10 players so mm. this wasn't a starting 11 this was just our top 10 players in any position uh, in order by the way from uh, when football started in 1992 and uh, we got a little bit of criticism for, for our teams certainly Paul Scholes at number 1 for me uh, led to a little bit of criticism we've gone for the Liverpool teams and the three of us have picked our Liverpool I haven't seen either of your teams so oh. I don't know how similar or dissimilar our teams are going to be who wants to who wants to put their hand up first here <sighs> go, ahead. go on go on Shane you're the host ah, here right We'll, Why uh, do I have to start? Take it down. Okay, there's my team in front of you. So I've gone for just for the people uh, listening this morning, as opposed to viewing. Fernando Torres at ten. You've gone for Steven Gerrard twice. No, sorry, that's that's a that graph. <laughs> <laughs> so good, they put him in twice. I, I have my I have the picks I sent on right right in front of me here. So that's clearly not the team. Have you gone like. for Steven Gerrard number one? Steve McManaman is number okay. is number nine. Uh, yeah. Number eight. I don't know if the rest of the numbers are affected. I don't think they are. Number eight, Virgil Van Dijk. Number seven, Sammy Hubia. <laughs> number six, Luis Suarez. Number five, Mo Salah. Four, Xabi Alonso, and then the top three. Three, Michael Owen, two, Robbie Fowler, and one, Stephen G. Let's do the other two now, and then we'll go back to them. Go on. So I'll go there. All right, so mine, for those who can't see, number 10, Alison Becker, number nine, Sammy Hoopia, number eight, Sadio Mane, injured last night, didn't play, number seven, Virgil van Dijk, and then six, two, three, for me, was very difficult. Mm. So six, Michael Owen, five, Fernando Torres, four, Robbie Fowler, three, Mo Salah, two, Luis Suarez, and number one, Stevie G. Okay. No arguments there so far. Nathan, you're at your 10. Yeah, I have gone with 10, Xabi Alonso. Eight, nine was Alisson. Eight, Sadio Mane. Seven, Jamie Carragher. Six, Jordan Henderson. Oh. Five, Robbie Fowler. Four, Virgil van Dijk. Three, Mo Salah. Two, Stephen Jordan. I've gone with Luis Suarez as my number one. Suarez is there for three and a half years only. That's the impact that guy had. So 13, 14. I think this is a different one to the Manchester United one because on Manchester United, you're generally able to judge on a similar level and that they've all almost all of them have won yeah, yeah. titles now maybe what they did in Europe should bring them to a, a higher level whereas for Liverpool there's players with great longevity who maybe didn't win what they felt they should deserve to win but I guess in both Gerrard and Carragher's case they still won a hell of a lot of everything mm. except the Premier League title uh, Luis Suarez as number one I understand the argument for Gerrard and like it's a strong argument for Gerard in terms of his brilliance, his longevity, uh, the fact that which I always find interesting. If you talk to the players of the Kenny Dalglish era, mm. almost all of them will say Stephen Gerrard was Liverpool's greatest ever player, which I often find quite surprising. I, I never had a great love for Gerrard. He was obviously one of the greatest players for big moments. Like he relished the biggest moments like the goal in the 2006 FA Cup final the more you watch it it's one of the most insane goals you'll ever see it's about <laughs> nearly 40 yards out yeah. the was last knackered. kick of the game he was and exhausted and he just uh, his it, technique it, helped him out it's an insane quality how can you Suarez above Gerrard? because Suarez so I've been covering the Premier League for probably 15-16 years and that season Suarez had where Liverpool went very close to the title is probably the best individual I've season I've seen since then in how he elevated a side. The two that stand out are him and Gareth Bale in those couple of years. They were simply unplayable. Mm. That was a that was a I would say a, a decent Liverpool team that he brought towards greatness. And you knew every week, every week he was going to do it. I think in talent alone, that season was Gerard one of the great. Did he though? Like Liverpool's greatest, and here 
now you end up in a hammering Steven Gerrard type scenario. <laughs> Tell us Liverpool's what best in Liverpool's best seasons when Gerrard was there, generally somebody else was the best player on the team. Whether it was Suarez that season, Fernando Torres, the influence of Xavi Alonso when they got to the Champions League final. There's no doubt, listen, Gerrard is number two on the list here. Mm. Uh, I just always find it very hard when I think of Liverpool in the Premier League not to go with Suarez because he was just unplayable. He got to a level in the Premier League that season that few players of any club have got to mm. individually. That's Jordan Henderson is in there, Nathan. Well, anyone who doesn't have Jordan Henderson on this li- list has a complete lack of understanding of football oh, and importance to sorry. football. We're not all so football it men. would be it it would be insane not to put Roy Keane on the Manchester United list. Like Jordan Henderson has been as important for Liverpool as Roy Keane has been for Manchester United. No. Nah. No, he absolutely has been. You can sorry, there's a definite argument as to their greatness as a player and if you're doing an all-time Premier League list, Roy Keane is well ahead of Jordan Henderson. You just have to look at the record of Jordan Henderson. There was a spell of four years where when Henderson was playing midfield, Liverpool lost three games. When he's not there, you even saw him, look at him Monday night when he's back in the team. The legs are obviously going, he can't do it as consistently as he could. His leadership, his drive, and his quality. Like, this comment that, you know, Alex Ferguson made at one stage about him not being able to run properly. These things have hung over him. He's the most underestimated player there has been of the last decade, by far. He is as pivotal as anybody to Liverpool's success. Now, he needed great players around him. Was he the greatest player in the middle of them? He had Salah, he had Van Dijk, he had Alisson, he had two unbelievable full-backs, he had Sadio Mane. But he was the glue in the middle of it all, and it's his decline. He is the one that is going to be most difficult to replace for Liverpool. Who have you left out, though? There, there, everything Jurgen Klopp tried to do was built around him that gag and press that go 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 as John Giles describes it <laughs> was built on Jordan Henderson being able to cover that ground and in every big game when you think back to the matches against Manchester City Chelsea Manchester United he was almost always one of the best players on the pitch so I would have no qualms whatsoever about putting Jordan Henderson in there in fact I was even considering him putting him a bit higher oh. he, was, he was 14th in my list um I think Jurgen Klopp is the making of him. I think, only I think top 10, yeah. the only thing that suffered, uh, that Henderson suffers from, is that he had a slow enough start to his career at yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. And Kenny Dalglish signed him, and then he was unfortunately constantly compared to his then teammate Steven Gerrard. Yeah, and then, when, and then when, he, when he was at Sunderland, he was this technically gifted midfielder, almost almost in a kind of number 10 ish mould, and then got deeper and deeper. The higher he went in the levels, there was players around him that were better. And then it was when Gerard left and someone had to stand up. Mm. And then Klopp coming in pretty much no, at that exact time Gerard after left. after Rogers. One of the key him. reasons I think Liverpool it didn't him. win the league in 2014 was Stephen, was Jordan Henderson getting sent off against Manchester City and being suspended for the final three games of the season. And Sorry. there was a better version of Je- Henderson that came after that. Oh, it was. That's but, that's, but even he, then, he was building. So it wasn't just when Gerard left. You but you have Michael Owen in your team, Nathan. No, and... Sorry, you're, you're top look, ten. Is it a recency bias when like McManaman's brilliance so many people would feel of that era he was one of the most talented English footballers yeah, around yeah. and Michael Owen obviously burst onto the scene is a golden boot winner at 18 I just struggle to find in terms of his actual impact it's because he joined United no I I, I it was such a long time afterwards it was a long time afterwards two clubs but I wonder there's definitely uh, he would admit himself like you know, Michael Owen when we talk in terms of love of Liverpool supporters. His legacy, yeah. He doesn't have that because he went to Manchester United. And see, McManaman loses a bit of that as well because of the way three. he ended up leaving the club. Why would you have him three above Mo Salah? Why not? Why not above Mo Salah? Uh, uh, you don't have Xabi Alonso there, Colin. Well, hold on, no, Mike Lohan, right, first of all. Right? <laughs> oh, on, no, no, defend it, no, defend it. I, I do want to hear it because I, I had him really high and I really struggled. Yeah, I had him I, I, Where I did you have him? I put him in the middle of the list, but I had okay. him. Where did I put him? You yeah, sixth. sixth. So I, I was going to put him about four, right? Ballon d'Or winner. Yeah, right. fact. And also from 1997 to 99, he did his hamstring against Leeds at Ellen Road and that was pretty much the beginning of the end because he kind of overplayed at that age. Mm. But remember when he played, came on against Wimbledon at Setters Park, Kenny Cunningham played in that game. Yeah. And I had never seen pace raw pace like it with the arguable exception of Brazilian Ronaldo I had never seen yeah. such pace and direct play and there was the game at St James's Park against Newcastle when he absolutely skinned the defenders put it in he had that strange kind of outside the right chip dink finish into the far corner from, for those two years in particular and then the two years afterwards from about 99 to 01 he was a lesser version of himself but there was that famous game against Arsenal in the FA Cup to win the final yeah. in Cardiff blistering pace incredible finishing and basically impossible to stop 
and really what was the end of Owen was himself with the hamstrings. Other than that, you're talking about a potentially multiple Ballon d'Or winning striker. He had everything he wanted I as a centre forward. I can't believe you've left, left him out. Oh, no, I think if Michael Owen had stayed fully fit, like you're potentially talking about one of Liverpool's greatest ever players and there's no way he would have ever gone near Manchester United yeah, because fitness. they would never would have uh, let him go. It just felt at that time there was a real inconsistency to Liverpool. I think all of these players had a big impact in rising the team above their level and yeah in 2001 when they won five trophies he was a a big part of that and he was there thereabouts I was definitely undecided about sort of 8, 9, 10 and even with Xabi Alonso there's a bit of Xabi Alonso there's a beauty to Xabi Alonso of you just want there him is. there but actually there is Colin is, is be- very tempted is because of that beauty is he overstated I had him as 10th but I was I was tempted to I had him drop him only I'd sent only I'd sent it in already I don't think he was I don't think he's a top 4 player in I think half. he was a beautiful footballer there's no doubt about that yeah. and would Liverpool have won the Champions League final in 2005 without him coming in and sort of freeing maybe Steven nope. Gerrard probably not but I don't know if he just did it consistently I enough. I thought you'd be a Xabi Alonso man. Love Xabi Alonso. Absolutely my type of player. But the one argument against him for me was that I think he got better when he left Liverpool with Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. I think he became an even better player. And I'm trying to pick players here that absolutely peaked at Liverpool. Did you both have Torres in? Yes. No, I, d- I didn't have Fernando oh, did Torres. You know Torres? No, I think Torres, Torres burned brightly. I think he was a... I was going to say a score of great goals rather than a great goal scorer. He he struggled for consistency at times, uh, blew very hot and cold, and didn't in the way that Salah at his best, almost like Salah this year, he struggled to impact on games mm. if he wasn't scoring. There would be a lot of matches where, you know, one of the famous games where he scored twice against Chelsea in injury time and games like that where he actually wouldn't do very much and then out of nothing, yeah. he's got himself a couple of goals. He was devastatingly brilliant in periods, but I think if you're looking back over the last you, 30 years, uh, is he a top 10? Like It's a remarkable thing the way Liverpool have consistently had their gone from Robbie yeah. Fowler through to Michael Owen, <laughs> little gap, and then you have Torres, Suarez, Same. Salah. This it's was tougher than the United one, wasn't uh, it? 100% tougher. Liverpool have the, the collection of the best forwards in Premier League yeah, history yeah. easily. Like, we haven't even touched on Sadio Mane yet. The one thing about Torres, I do think he suffers from the perception of him post-Liverpool. Mm. And I think people really do forget Chelsea between... Years. When he signed in 2007, that first season he scored 24 Premier League goals. Mm. And up until about 2009, do you remember just around the 2010 World Cup when he got injured? And I think his last great moment for Liverpool was, funnily enough, against Chelsea in that November yeah. that he moved to Chelsea in, in the January when he scored that great goal curled it into the far corner I think w- when you're talking about technically gifted strikers Torres is way down the list there's better players than him played for Liverpool mm. but I think he maximised the ability that he had and had a phenomenal partnership with Steven Gerrard Did you both have Hoopia in? Yes No, it, no. Oh, I did Anyway, I think Sammy Hoopy was a very very good defender but if we're talking you'd top Carragher, 10 you'd Carragher I, probably had him. I, Carragher. I had Carragher and took Carragher out because I remember Carragher saying that Hoopy was, was the better player than him so yeah. I said oh, if Carragher says it then he won't mind me taking him out of the top 10 Yeah we'll admit it Um let us yeah, know what you think in the there. comments. Yeah, what's what are your Liverpool top ten? I I find that difficult. I have to say, it. more difficult than the United one. Well, most, I, said, I, 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 I think because you are judging us, so you're having to put Carragher and Gerrard, Alonso up against players who've won Premier League titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's Different definitely generations. like the, this Liverpool team have been by far and away Liverpool's best team yeah. of the Premier League generation. So, you know, I I was close to putting Trent in, to putting Andy Robertson in. That would have been too much. Yeah, too Why? much recency bias. Uh, well, I haven't seen a player like Trent Alexander-Arnold. That's what I mean. Andy I'm, Robertson uh, is Liverpool's. I haven't seen like Liverpool's like greatest ever eleven was sort of set in stone for a long time. Whereas now, you know, Allison, Trent, Robertson, mm. Van Dijk, Henderson, Salah, Mane are all probably pushing for it. This generation, it's like the Irish rugby team. Just before we go to yep. Martin Lifton and the ads, mm. our own Dara Smith Nocton, uh, who's on workplace and does at the moment internship. Yeah, he has also got involved. Okay, and I just want to highlight that he's included Pepe Reina in his list <sighs> at number ten. Dara. Come on. No, Alisson. No, Alisson. I mean, if you've ah. got to pick a goalkeeper, pick the current goalkeeper. I didn't pick Alisson. I didn't pick any Pepe goalkeeper. Pepe was a very likeable man. but Likeable man. But it helps him. It's like the opposite of Michael Owen. Yeah. Jersey Dudek. <laughs> yeah. Throw him in. Robbie Keane, a few of the comment, commenters were saying this morning. <laughs> Let us know in the comments who else you would have included in your Liverpool. So it's top 10 players of the Premier League year, but you have to do it in order. Don't cop out. Put them 10 to 1. And uh, let us know in the comments. Uh, so it is four minutes past eight on this morning's OTB AM on Wednesday's OTB AM brought to you as always live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We'll be back in just a second talking Spurs with Martin Lipton. You're listening to OTB AM. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? Troy Parrott obviously injured the hamstring in the process no of scoring. 
He's got no pace, I'm afraid. He's a nice footballer. He hasn't scored many goals, as we know, as well, but he's at that level. I don't know where he'll end up. He's obviously only on loan at best, and he'll go back to Tottenham, but he, he certainly will not get anywhere near Tottenham's team, I'm afraid. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Five minutes past eight on this Wednesday morning's OTB. I'm delighted to have you with us, with myself and Nathan, and delighted to have Martin Lipton on the line this morning with us as well. Morning, Martin. Good morning. Uh, so a wonderful defeat for, for Spurs last night uh, to AC Milan in the first leg of their Champions League knockout game. I mean, all the way to the final in 2019, Martin, and there were plenty of comebacks in that in that uh, run as well, so you just have to do it all again. Yeah, I mean, they were very ordinary last night. I thought they, until the last 10 minutes, they were probably worth a draw. In the end, they got away with a 1-0 defeat. Um, the lack of conviction about the performance was clear from start to finish. Poor goal to concede. I thought Foster was a bit unlucky, actually, because he made a great uh, double save, actually. But they weren't very good. And over the 90 minutes, they got away with it. Seems like a very basic thing to say when you're away from home in a, in a first leg of a Champions League knockout game. Keep it tight for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. Don't concede. Well, but like, yeah. they, they, like they, they, they threw that rule out the, out the book straight away. It was a disappointing goal to concede. It, it was. It was a poor goal. I mean, the good thing was that they actually then were the better team, I think, for the rest of that half. They, without ever, I don't think, looking like scoring. Um, and that's a credit to particularly the two young boys in midfield in Skip and, and Saar because there was a huge expectation or huge responsibility on them in a game that they'd not played uh, a match of that stature before. And I thought they did very, very well. Saar in particular looks a real player. Um, but overall, the performance was, was, was poor. I think Romero hasn't played well all season when he's worn a white shirt. He's looked, he's looked quite good in blue and white stripes. Um, less good in his first shirt. He hasn't. And again, he was asleep at the start for the first goal, then out jumped. Uh, Dyer should have maybe got a bit closer to stop the initial shot, but the deflection led to the goal. And But if you look at it, there was a free man at the back post as well. They really weren't weren't great. I think Perisic struggled to to impact on the game. Uh, and, and I said genuinely and generally, they were they were pretty lucky to get away with a 1-0. Hey, you look at that team, like you mentioned the, the, the young lads in the middle of that pitch, like Bentanker injured and Hoybier suspended as well. Uh, Saar in particular we should touch on Martin because what is he 20 years of age it was only his 6th appearance for Spurs in any competition so to be thrust into a game at the San Siro like that and, and do as well as he did was was quite the achievement Yeah I mean physically he's pretty impressive isn't he he's athletic he's powerful uh, he looks like he can he can think his way through a game he, just, he looks like a smart boy that extra year he had in France playing now and again uh, in Serie so in Liga probably helped him if he just played in the reserves at Spurs um, it would have been a problem for him. I think clearly there's a football player there uh, and he's still a very young boy. Skip has been around the scene a bit longer but it was still a big a big test and a big ask of them both and I think that, that those were the two that passed. The others uh, probably failed in truth. There have been too many false dawns when it comes to midfielders for Tottenham going on oh, probably a decade at this stage. I was just thinking back the first game I ever commentated on for off the ball was a North London derby. Thomas Rzyski scored after about 10 seconds and I was looking in midfield that day were Nabil Bentaleb and Sandro and then Ryan Mason came in very quickly and thought maybe Mason and Bentaleb will be the future for the next 10 years and then Dembele came in and always felt like he was on the cusp of greatness. There's been a, a kind of 18 month, every 18 months a constant change in central midfielders and just feels like none of them have ever got to that real elite level. When you look at, at Saar or maybe even Skip if you got a run of games, do they have that sort of potential to become proper mainstays of a Tottenham midfield? Well, with Spurs you never know. I would say that Dembele for two years was probably the best midfielder in the Premier League. Uh, it was just he he became that too late in his career, and then then injuries started to take their toll, and and he and he, he wasn't at that level for very long. But he was he was excellent. Likewise, when they had uh, Wanyama there for a while, he was he was pretty decent. But you, I think that Saar could be a real player, and he looks as though he might have more in his game um, than Hoiberg. But it's very easy to say that after one match or two matches. Let's see where you are after after 30 or 40. Hoberg has, has actually been a very consistent performer for Spurs. If you remember, he, he's the reason they were playing last night against Milan with his goal in the last minute against Marseille. Otherwise, they'd have been playing 
in, an, in a different week that have gone through, but in second place in the group. So they, Hoburg's the reason they got home advantage. They missed him badly yesterday because he gives them extra drive uh, on the ball and off it. Uh, so, it, But you would imagine that it will be him and, and Saar now for the rest of the season as the first two. Uh, and that gives you a, a guess, a bit of um, and athleticism and power as well as, uh, as, as, as an experience. You've got that fusion. Uh, but it's far too early to expect Saar to be you know, 8 out of 10 every game. He's, he's still a young boy. What did you make, uh, Martin, of, of Antonio, Antonio Conte's comments before the game? So, of course, the Leicester 4-1 defeat last weekend, very disappointing. And talked about his players sometimes failing to cope with pressure, which, which, I mean, seemed quite pointed to come from a manager, but maybe that's what the Spurs players need at the moment. I think he's trying to think of what works. Let's do some shock therapy. Because um, they were pitiful on, on Saturday, having been so impressive the previous week against City. Uh, but then you look at the guy, the team that played against City and... It wasn't the team that played last night because of, of a, a variety of factors. You know, no goalkeeper and neither of the two midfielders. So from having a full a full full strength squad, they suddenly got six players out um, from a, arguably one of the biggest matches of the season. So maybe he thought that one or two of them were feeling a bit sorry for themselves and he wanted to sort of just spark a reaction. I think that, that, that may have been it. Or he just felt, actually, someone's got to tell the truth, that when it comes to it, too often they swallow. He's not wrong. It must be incredibly frustrating for him as much as he has to take some responsibility for it, that lack of consistency. And he's almost talking about his players there just sort of being mentally weak at times. They go on these runs of fixtures where they, Kane and Son are firing a fun cylinders and then there's a, a massive setback. They, they've rarely had the run that, say, an Arsenal have gone on this season or a relentlessness of a Manchester City or a Liverpool and maybe that's just down to pure quality but it does seem to be down as well he feels to, to the character of the players that they're they're lacking that bit of drive to really get to that higher level Well a lot of these players were in the team that didn't lose a single home match in 16-17 uh, so they weren't, they weren't that bad then um, I think genuinely though they've just been sure um, they haven't been consistent and far too often I think if you ask every Spurs fan they'll tell you Big match on Saturday. Bet we won't turn up, and lo and behold, they don't turn up. They, you know, their attitude is wrong. Uh, against Arsenal in both games this season, they didn't turn up. It's more often away from home, uh, except against Manchester City when they actually do play. There's the one team they think they can beat, and they play quite well against them. Even the game they lost this season, they should have won. Um, but against anybody else, you know, United this season, awful. Um, Liverpool first half, awful. Chelsea, very lucky. Arsenal, both games, awful. It's been a fairly consistent story this season, but not just this season. It is the history of Tottenham. It's mad, Martin, as well. You look at the Premier League table and, and they're only, what, two points off Newcastle, albeit with a, with a game more played. So for a season that, that hasn't exactly gone all to plan, they're still very much in the top four battle. And, and, and look, the game against West Ham at home this Sunday takes on quite significant meaning now. Yeah, win that, and they're potentially in a really good position, particularly they then play Chelsea before Newcastle play. If they were to win them both, they'd be above Newcastle, um, albeit with more games played. Big if, though, isn't it? Um, the truth is they haven't played well in more than a couple of games all season. Uh, yes, City, first half away, second half, and the whole game at home, and a couple of others, but they haven't played well. And yet, they're because of the quality of players, because they've got Harry Kane, if we're being honest, they're winning games. Now, at the moment, I thought Kane, Kane got an absolute batter in yesterday. If you can explain to me how Simon Sher can whack Kane five times and not get a booking, and Dyer gets booking for his first foul, I don't understand, but there you go. Um, and that may be different in the home match. But I thought both Son and Kulisewski were poor. Uh, and Kane was on his own, effectively, yesterday for most of the game. And he, he can't keep on pulling them out of the fire. Martin, from watching not just Tottenham this season, but a lot of the teams, how big a factor do you think the World Cup is on a lot of the inconsistency that we're seeing? You talk about Christian Romero, and it does feel, I was saying earlier, it feels like he should be in that elite bracket of centre-halves, but then you watch him play, and there seemed to be a rashness to his play constantly. And like last night, it was such a bad tackle in the second half, a silly tackle. Uh, young Min Son has been nowhere near the player. He just looks totally mentally drained. I know Kane has been able to step up, but... Do you feel that having a World Cup mid-season has taken more out of these players than, than we're given credit for? 
I think it's taken a lot out of everyone because it ha was such an unprecedented situation. The, family, the PFA were really worried about injuries in January for the players who went to the World Cup and the ones who didn't go to the World Cup because of the demands and stresses and strains on their bodies. And, and there have been a lot of injuries, as we've seen. You know, Van dyke has been out for, for Liverpool. He's just on his way back. Spurs have now lost uh, Bentanko and Basuma. Not Basuma didn't go to the World Cup. Cup. Bentanko did. Bentanko got injured at the World Cup. Richarlison got injured at the World Cup. So Spurs have, have suffered from it in a lot of ways. But that's why you have a squad. I'm not going to have that as an excuse. And also, most of the top teams had a lot of players at the World Cup. So they're all in the same boat. It's just a question of whether or not your body holds up to the stresses and strains. And sometimes you get a run of bad at Arsenal have played effectively the whole the whole team. Also, you know, seven of them have started every game, but a lot of those players were involved. Um, part, you know, Party went to the World Cup, Saka went to the World Cup, Martinelli was in the squad. Gabriel Jesus would have been if he if you know, um, if it hadn't been for for his in, injuries, etc. So actually got injured in the World Cup. So, but they've kept going. Ramsdale went to the World Cup, but yeah, that they have not shown um, any. A backlash to it they just kept on winning obviously it's a huge game tonight Arsenal Manchester City uh, it'll be built as maybe a, a decisive game in the Premier League season it reminds me a bit of was it Arsenal Leicester the year Leicester won it and Arsenal beat Leicester we thought well that was the end of it uh, for Leicester but Leicester obviously came back does this feel decisive does this feel like a game Arsenal simply can't afford to lose I think if they lose and suddenly the five point lead becomes no point lead and second on goal difference having dropped eight points out of nine you'd wonder about their capacity to come back uh, a draw for Arsenal tonight is not a bad result given that they played a game uh, a game fewer than um, than City so they could stretch the lead again a defeat I, I do think it would have a huge impact on both teams but particularly on Arsenal because of that is that you know the first time they've hit a really poor run of form at the worst possible time? City have will have absolutely taken advantage, and you look at that and think, it, City are going to win this, aren't they? Arsenal will get a result tonight with a, a draw or a win, and you think they're really in control of their own destiny. They do seem to be heading in two different directions, Martin. Maybe that's me reading too much into a couple of weeks, but. Uh, you'd, be, you'd be quite concerned with the nature of Arsenal's performances in the last couple of weeks, for sure. They were poor at Everton, and they weren't great against Brentford. And all, also, they've got this sort of sense of grievance, which might help over the decision on the, the Brentford equaliser. Mm. Though I, I did notice, I, I didn't rather, more importantly, notice Arteta saying, yeah, but you actually should have been a, a goal for Brentford in the first half, because that was never a foul by Mbwemo. But there you go. Uh, such is the way of the world. Um it depends how they react. And we won't know that until we see them on the pitch tonight. Are they going to uh, gird their loins, come again and fight? Or are they starting to think, uh, we've done really well, but it's just not meant to be? And you can sometimes see that in teams where they not necessarily give up the ghost, but start to lose the belief that they can, they can achieve. And this will be the acid test of whether Arsenal really believe. Now, they could play really well and lose. That's possible. They are playing Man City. Uh, with with or without Holland, they're playing the best football team in the division. But Arsenal have been the best side this season. And if they play to the standards they set until just a couple of weeks ago, and they're at home, they play like they did against United, Arsenal will win this game. If they play like they did against Brentford and Everton, they'll lose. I mean, that's that's the reality. But teams can find their form. And in the biggest games, you find out the biggest characters, don't you? Is there a way in which the, the financial charges levelled at Manchester City are going to potentially give them a, a kickstart for the rest of the season? I mean, there's nothing more than they'd love than a little bit of siege mentality potentially to, to kick them forward. We saw the massive banner unfurled last weekend at the Etihad against Villa, you know, in support of the lawyer, for example. They were booing the Premier League anthem before the game. So there is this siege mentality that, that Man City will have taken to the next level for the rest of the season, Martin. Yeah, there's nothing better in football than a cause, is there, sometimes? Um... And if you look at the last time they were banned by UEFA, they won the next five matches, including at Real Madrid away. Uh, and then lockdown came and we, everyone forgot about it. Um, so history repeats itself and they're in a great position, City. They'll, they'll be four points clear. We will see very soon. 
Um, I still think that those two games between them, not just this one tonight, but also the one in April, will have a decisive bearing on it in the long term. But City want to, whatever happens, City want to be able to say, well, we were the real champions. We were the team that everyone knows was the best team. And even if they take our title away, everyone knows. And I'm sure that'll be the discussion. We want to show everyone that we're the best. There's even problems there for, for Arsenal, like regardless of Erling Haaland, whether or not he's fit. You, you see someone like Julian Alvarez coming into that City team and, and causing problems in his own right. So regardless of, of what the problem is, you, you still have to contend with different types of, of scenarios. And, and Haaland's fitness, of course, he's important to that City team. But they have so many options and st- such strength and depth, Martin, that it's not, it's not a death knell to their title charges if, he, if he's not fit for, for a game or two. No, absolutely. Look, we know that City can play without a centre forward. They did it for two years. Uh, and that pattern of play is ingrained into them. They know what to do. Uh, this season, arguably, they've been less, they've certainly been less less good on the eye, but they've had the cutting edge. And actually, maybe Holland needs a couple of weeks off. I don't know. It may be good for him to come back fresher because he was looking a bit more frustrated by actions in games recently. You know, the game at Spurs, he didn't have a touch in the Tottenham box for the first time in a match. And he was running channels and getting nowhere. You could see the frustration. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's good. I, I, the key is always is how De Bruyne plays. If he plays well, City win. Doesn't matter who the centre forward is. Because he's just the most talented player in the Premier League and the best football player in the Premier League. And if he's on, on his game, he'll find a way to win it for City. There's really no guarantee of that, though. And I think that's the one thing out of tonight that I think there's a mental challenge for Arsenal if they were to lose this, that actually it's not the end of the road. City, I could be wrong, I just don't see them putting together that run of 10, 12 straight victories. They haven't shown that level of consistency. De Bruyne definitely hasn't shown that level of consistency. But you feel with Arsenal... They had it in previous seasons until they did. Yeah, well, that that, that is the problem. They've done it and they have the track record of, of being able to do it. That's... For Arsenal, it is that fact of if you've dropped eight points out of nine, mm. does it suddenly become that collapse, just the sense of foreboding around the place and it becomes a, you know, another easy title for Manchester City. And what you do, maybe there at the back of Arteta's man, he was in the squad, albeit injured, in fifteen sixteen, when Arsenal were five points clear after half the games. Uh, everyone talks about Spurs losing the title. It was Arsenal who threw the title away. They only won seven of their last 20 matches that season. Yeah, it, look, it remains to be seen. Tonight's going to be the first step. <laughs> I mean, as you said, still have to play each other twice, so remains to be seen what's going to happen. But uh, Arteta versus Pep tonight will certainly uh, keep our attention. Martin Gritstone, as always, thanks a million. Right, take care. Bye-bye. Right. Martin Lipton there, of course, football writer. Uh, with the sun, 22 minutes past eight on this uh, Wednesday morning at p.m. It's, uh, it's going to be a title race, Nathan. I remember we sat in a room, this very room, just before Christmas, and did our predictions for the for the remain mm-hmm. for the sporting year twenty twenty three. Myself, yourself, and Jer, if I'm c- correct, predicted City to go on and win the title, and Adrian Barry held firm with Arsenal. Yeah, but the easy easy answer was to pick Arsenal because you get all the credit if you're right. And good point. So I I think it was a no risk pick where you forget about it. Otherwise, I I can't wait for tonight's game. I will be really interested to see what Arteta does. They've named an unchanged team for six games in a row. Mm. Trossard has come in and done very well. He got the goal at the weekend. I thought he he won the game for them against Manchester United in that last 15 minutes. Does he start him ahead of Martinelli? Does he try and shake it up and maybe play Martinelli up top instead of Nketiah and bring Trossard in on the left-hand side? Or does he feel that actually it hasn't been that bad in the last couple of games? Like It's not a case of being bullied by Manchester City. It's a case of being outplayed and they were bullied by Everton. Felt in a way they were sort of bullied by Brentford. You know, Martin touched on that goal that was disallowed for Brentford. They were physically stronger than them. Mm. I'm just not convinced by City. I was commentating on their game at the weekend against Aston Villa. It was comfortable, very comfortable, but they're trying all sorts of things. You know, they played three at the back, an official three at the back almost, because they've been, you know, naming four defenders, but Rico Lewis is playing at right back or left back, but doing the Cancelo thing and playing in midfield. They played a sort of three, two, two, three formation. I thought the Bruyne was fine. Bernardo Silva's playing an awful lot deeper. And listen, they have proven again and again that they can go on these runs, but it does feel as though they're not quite at the level they were at. And, you know, as a neutral in this, I think you want 
Arsenal to get something out of it. You want there mm. to be a dramatic title race, and like this could be what sparks them into life. I do think that Leicester Arsenal game could be relevant, though, in that everybody said when it was, I think it was it might well have been this day uh, of the season. <clears throat> everyone felt when Arsenal beat them that day that that was it for Leicester. Like Danny Welbeck scores last kick of the game. <laughs> Simpson had been sent off. There's no way Leicester come back from this. And then Arsenal were the one who collapsed and Leicester go on this uh, insane run. I think if Arsenal were to lose tonight, they need to look at it like that. But yeah, I cannot wait for this. Early kickoff, remember, half yeah, seven. Half seven, so get in there ahead of the Champions League tonight. So uh, yeah, Emirates Stadium, Arsenal Man City, 7.30pm tonight, of course. We'll react to that game on tomorrow morning's show, 25 past eight on this Wednesday morning, OTBM. Time to say a very good morning to Keith Wood. Morning, Keith. Morning, Shane. How are you? Keeping well, thanks. Keeping well. We're gonna we're gonna keep uh, this reaction going to the to the France game because we want to keep talking about it. Let's be honest. Um, ball in play for for over forty six minutes. It turns out that the longer the ball is in play, the better a match is going to be, and the better Ireland's chances of winning are. Well, that's what it looks like from the weekend. Um, uh, I watched the game at home. Um, I had been down at the under-20 game in Cork the night before, which was fantastic as well, seeing all the mm. the next generation that are kind of coming through, which was lovely. So I was kind of excited when the game started. Um, but I couldn't get over how long the first half. I couldn't get over how long this... It was the longest game of rugby. It was... Um, the level of excitement of edge of the seat stuff because Ireland were trying everything um, and France were trying everything. I mean, it took two teams and um, it's it's kind of a joy when you get around to seeing a game playing at that level. It's the best game I've ever seen Ireland play. And I know there's that's hyperbole, but maybe it's just at this stage. I, just, I can't remember a game I enjoyed as much um, that had absolutely everything. And, but I, it, for me, it's the freedom in which the team played, the, uh, the the fact that they're allowed to be themselves, that they're allowed to have a go, that um, like there's a couple of passes from Caelan Doris that you'd have got a bollocking from in the not too distant past and in the distant past. You'd have got a bollocking your whole life if you try to pass the, the last pass that he gave. Um, and it just, it, there was no uncertainty. It just didn't look like anybody was in any doubt. They were, it was the right thing to do, have a go at it. There's a great joy when you're able to see that, but then there's a better joy still when everything that's tried pretty much comes off. There was one question about Andy Farrell when he came in was that he was a big part of the Joe Schmidt era. And how much he had bought into what Joe Schmidt was about. When you're talking there about that freedom, it does feel as though they've retained a lot of the good bits of the Schmidt era, the structure, uh, but that Farrell has given them something that they can go and express themselves, that particularly in that last year last year of Schmidt where it felt like they were, they were playing with fear. That fear is completely gone now, but at the same time, the quality they're passing, the, the importance of doing the simple things right, that also hasn't been lost. Well, it's it's brilliantly exciting. It's in no way reckless. Yeah, I don't know that it's reckless, but I, I do think, uh, Nathan, that it's... I think it seems a little bit more natural and I think it seems more fun. And um, I know this is a serious thing and we'll talk about Wales and the, the pearl estate that they're in, but... Um, it is a game as well. I know it's a business, but it's a game and games are meant to have fun. And it looks like this is a team that has fun. And, and, and look, I've said it for a lot of different coaches as they get towards the end of their tenure, um, the, the, the fun element almost goes and it becomes too much of a job and you begin overthinking different things. And we're, we're still in early stages, I think, with Andy Farrell. Um, but I would all, always, always say that, you know, players are, sorry, coaches that are in other coaching setups, if they're not the boss, they have to follow what the boss dictates. Now, they can try and convince them, but if if the coach isn't for turning, they still have to go with what the boss says. And uh, I think there's a fairly stark change. Um, and what I would say from Farrell, Farrell is a rugby guy. No, he's a rugby league guy but and a rugby union guy, but... He is and has been a success in everything he's done on the sporting field. 
And I think he would have seen in fairly stark view that some of the joy had gone and some of the things that had gone wrong at the end of what was the best ever tenure from an Irish coach and Joe Schmidt. You know, there was incredible success in that period of time. But at the end of it, that joy seemed to have gone. Um, that freedom of expression seemed to have gone. Um, that's what it looks like at the moment. I think it's a structured game, but it's a structured game where decisions have to be made. So the players have been kind of forced to lead and to make decisions. And that's what leading is. So it isn't a script that you have someone shouting from the sideline saying, kick this ball, do that thing. It's see what's in front of you, give it as many options as you can possibly get, make the right option. And I have to say, for, as a fan, as an ex-player, as a fan, whatever, you know, you're looking at it, it's fantastic to watch. It's just, there's a and long may continue. And without getting overly excited by it, I am overly excited by it because I think you have to celebrate when days like that happen. But, um, um, like it's a, it was an extraordinary performance. Two great teams of a team that hasn't lost for, uh, for a long period of time who are um have some of the most gifted players that have ever played the game i mean in peno i think he's extraordinary in dupont he's unbelievably an incredible player back at his absolute best um and it was a joy to watch an irish team beat them and beat them in the fashion which they did and i think you have to celebrate that i mean you don't take anything for granted for the next time and i always kind of put that in but that's something that's that's important but you have to you have to kind of take the joy and say, well, wow, that's an amazing thing. And we experienced an amazing thing and watched it last weekend. Did want to get your take, Keith, on the uh, the Antonio yellow card. Um and of course that look the, the the game would have been impacted if 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 Ireland had the man extra, but Wayne Barnes' decision has left a lot of people scratching their heads. I look, I think he'd been trying to have a discussion during the week. Um, prior to it, in terms of contacts that are made in the in the chest that move up that may not have the same level of risk, and I actually think there was merit in his conversation. There wasn't on Saturday um, because the impact was substantial, and um, um, it, should, it was a red card. I mean, you're listening to his rationale, and you're saying, okay, there's uh, there's a certain element there that makes sense uh, in certain circumstances, but not in this one. And um, I don't know whether you can't double guess what he was thinking or not thinking, but for me, that, that was a red card. I mean, look, I looked at it in a few different things. I felt there was a few things that were wrong at the weekend, and I don't want to be constantly beating up on on tmos and referees and stuff like that because i think they have a very tough job um but i don't think it's bad it's a wrong thing to say that that's a wrong decision and that needs to be looked at and there needs to be a clarification for world rugby on it there also needs to be the the proper angles to see whether a try is scored or not because there was enough of images that came out after the fact of james lowe's try with his foot in the ground i wasn't 100 percent certain whether he'd placed the ball in the area or not, but that's fine because that's a referee's view. And he said, no, I think it's a try. And if you can say anything rather, you know, that, that doesn't dispute that, then it's a try. That's fine. But there were images and it doesn't do the game a service when those images come out too late to be able to, to solve the, the situation. So there are two things that need to be looked at in the light of rugby to say that we're trying to make the game um fair and understandable for everybody and they are two instances where look that's wrong and i've been i haven't stepped away from this idea of the red cards i think you need to bring that a hinge to the hip for the tackle um i understand that certain things can be can be looked at differently in a soaking tap tackle that may have had contact may be different but i do think we need to get the level of the height down um down to chest height uh, you know, chest height and lower, and that's where it has to be. Um, and then you can look at mitigation afterwards. But a guy who's six foot four standing straight up, there's no mitigation in that. Keith, if we were sitting here today and France had won that game, we'd be doing a deep analysis of Ireland's failings and psychologically what this means ahead of the World Cup and a potential World Cup quarterfinal and Ireland's ability when it really matters to beat the very top tier in a competitive Six Nations game, 
we're not really looking at it now from a French point of view. They were on this brilliant winning run and they've come up against the best team in the world and they've been beaten and you know they threw absolutely everything at them. It wasn't as if they didn't perform on Saturday and they still weren't good enough. Do you think there'll be that sort of introspection and do you think they need that sort of introspection now in France ahead of the World Cup? I, look, I know there's been a bit of introspection from the uh, from the French media. Um, I spoke to a couple of guys in the French camp this time last year, actually, and um, I, really interesting conversation in that um, they've been trying to build up the confidence of the team and it had worked. It was a high level of positive affirmation that everything was good, just get better, don't concentrate on the negatives, concentrate on the positives, build the team up. And that's phenomenal when you're going well. And um, you know that you have a coach and management in your corner that are fighting your corner, you know, that are willing you to play and allowing you to make a mistake without being castigated afterwards. And that's a pretty cool thing. Um, so it's perfect when they win. But um, what happens when they lose? Are they Do they doubt themselves then when that happens? Do they feel like imposters in their own team that, that the information that's been given to them is lies in, in certain respects? Um, or is this the loss that puts them on the road to greatness? Because I think as a team, and you look at France, this is a team of great individuals. And I think like in every team that does well, all the other teams look at them and say, how are we able to dismantle this team? And uh, I was asked last week uh, by French media, um, you know, what were the weaknesses I saw in the French? I was asked, was there a few different questions? I answered the questions and I said, look, we need to be in a position where we dismantle the weaknesses. And they said, well, highlight the weaknesses. And I ignored that text. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, we'll wait till, till afterwards. But the weaknesses are their strengths, are the huge men that they have in the pack that are incredible at scrummaging, incredible at grinding out teams. They're perfectly built for playing against someone like um, South Africa. They're able to meet that big power game. And then there's the incredible individuals in the back line. When you move them around the field all over the place and you don't give away any scrums, you don't knock on the ball at all, you play with a high level of discipline, those huge men were becoming a liability. They were wrecked coming off the field. I mean, it was quite interesting how tired they were. Um, and I, it's not to say that they don't play in that way, but France now have to figure out a way to slow down a team like Ireland that plays at that level of attention to detail and that pace. So they have to slow down the rocks. They have to, to figure those things out. So I would say from France, if they get it right, this can be the making of them, actually, because this is somebody that has taken them on at a level that destabilizes them. And that now has highlighted a weakness and they need to sort that weakness out. The, the the strength and depth you, you don't win a World Cup without without a, a, a bit a little bit of strength and depth at the very least Keith and and you look at this Irish team now and you see the lads coming off the bench and albeit we're missing probably three or four of our best players uh, at the weekend against France and still won with such with such relative ease and um, you see someone like Tom O'Toole come off the bench and slot straight in uh, Craig Casey as well Conan came in there uh, you know and, and these lads were were coming into the team fairly early during the second half as well but Ross Byrne is someone who uh, a lot of the focus, of course, has been on him, naturally enough. Like, he, he comes in after, I think, 48 minutes at the weekend and really slots in just perfectly. Well, I, I, look, we discussed this, Shane, a couple of weeks ago, that um, in, in the almost the protection that Johnny is getting in the position he's playing with the options he's been given in the system that they have suits Ross Byrne. Mm. And he he kicks incredibly well. I don't think he, he makes the the same quality of decisions as Johnny. Um, but I think the more he plays, the better chance he has of doing that, right? So the, the more he, the more options he gets, the better chance he has of doing it. I, look, I thought he played he th played pretty well. Um, the uh, I, I don't think our, our attacking play is as fluid, and I don't think it could be as fluid because Johnny is like a, a general on the field and... Um, but again, the more you play, the better chance that you have for it. I think the structure suits. Um, I will say every time I see Ross Byrne kick a ball, I just think he's the most effortless kicking style of of any player. Um, and I think he's had an awful lot of downs in his career. And he's still here. 
you know, and that's like I love that um uh you know the balls of a player like that to to take as many knocks as he's got and to still be there and to still um be able to stand tall and play and uh um and end out a game with with 30 minutes to go and you know and how much doubt has that fella had in his head over the last few years how much doubt have people spoken about in terms of it and he still is able to do it on the biggest play so i just think that's an that's an extraordinary thing for for a player like him for some of the other players tom O'Toole, i think is is fortunate in some respects there were very few scrums um because at times he struggled with that but you know that he's going to get confidence from playing it uh craig casey uh, i'm a fan of craig casey and i'm a fan of him when he plays like he was when he started and that's what he did at the weekend i don't necessarily want craig casey going for a gap um uh, he's he's a small player i want him to be on his feet linking constantly and when that happens i think his pass is just startling so i don't want him thinking of anything else i'd like him to revert uh, uh you know, i'm sure he's he's annoyed with the constant similarities with stringer but i want him to act like a stringer that he is the link so that he should always be where the ball is. The ball should be in his hands and out of his hands as quickly as possible. I think that gives Ireland an opportunity to play at a really, really fast pace. I thought Conor Murray had done extraordinarily well beforehand. Um, and uh, I just think that when, when Craig came on, the the speed of that pass was fun, was fantastic, was phenomenal. So, look, I, I thought it was a full squad. Um, and I just... But it was a joy to watch. That's, you know, I, I, you should never step away from the fact that you watch the game because it's fun, you know, and it's exciting and it makes you feel good about yourself. And imagine what it does for the players that are on the field. Yeah, you could even you could see it with Johnny Sexton even before the game with the, the, the national anthem and the emotions that were that were around the team for sure. Um you, you touched on it earlier, Keith, that the, the turmoil in Wales at the moment is is uh, quite concerning for Warren Gatland and everyone involved in, in Welsh rugby. Uh and the story in the back pages of, of, of some of the papers this morning, um, which a lot of people will have seen, the Six Nations match between England and Wales. Uh, into doubt, plunged into doubt, reports uh, emerging that Wales players considering strike action over their stalling contract renewal. So they're uh, apparently due to meet this week, the players, um, the squad and the rest of Wales professional players. Uh, one quote from a player who was featured apparently in both of Wales games in the Six Nations, speaking to the Daily Mail, says, I can't believe I'm five months away from the end of my contract, eight months away from the World Cup and my future isn't certain yet. I can't apply for a mortgage and I'm on antidepressants. I'm also one big injury away from not having a job in July and yet I'm starting for Wales every week and the WRU is making tens of millions from international matches. Bit of a... Um, a concerning situation for Welsh rugby, Keith. Well, it is, and um, I would always say there are there's a much wider context, and um, if we go very wide and very narrow, it's probably the best way to do it. Very wide is that the game is struggling heavily for finance. Um, COVID has put everybody under pressure. We should never um, step away from the fact that when. Um, when COVID struck here, uh, the government gave grants and um, uh, supported sport uh, of all types in, in Ireland. And uh, in the UK, they gave loans and those loans have to be paid back. And that has put a huge amount of teams um, and unions under pressure. Um, I've spoken to, in the last two months, I've spoken to five um, different owners of of, of clubs and franchises and uh, one of them has said look they, they have a really good chance of breaking even this year and that sounds fantastic um, but breaking even doesn't take away from the debt that you have and the debt that, the amount of money that was put into the club in the first place and the amount of money that has to be paid back over the next number of years so the game is struggling very heavily um, trying to figure out what is the best route for it um, you need huge numbers coming through. The, the bigger the numbers that you have coming through, the more sustainable the, the game is. Um, there's a huge doubt, uh, like from a player's perspective, to find out that he doesn't have a contract, but you can't give a contract to somebody unless you know you can pay it. Mm. Um, and that's one, of the, that's one of the pieces that they're stuck in at the present moment in time. So Wales are looking to try and have a viable financial model which is a restructuring of the contracts as the contracts come to an end. 
So they've been waiting for the contracts to come to the end to look for a more uh, centralized system of payments that fit the bill to the finances that they have at their disposal to be able to pay off all their debts. And they haven't got to that at the yet to be uh, at this time. So to be to be in the situation in the middle of a Six Nations thinking along that way, it's incredibly frightening for players. Um, and uh, like I've I've just watched some of the commentary that some of the people are complaining while some of these people are getting three or four hundred thousand. You know they shouldn't be complaining. This is an incredibly tough game. And if we saw anything at the weekend, you can see injuries happen all the time. You can be finished next week. And this is one part of your life, not all of it. And you could finish at 25 or 30 and you still have the rest of your life to go and live. The amount of money that's earned may not be viable for the sport, but it's not enough for the player. So it's an incredibly difficult place to be in. And um, look, I know that Jan Evans has just gone in as as, as chairman. I know Jan very well. Um, good, honest, strong guy. Um but every every day in Wales, there seems to be a new issue. So um, there's a, they have a big job on their hands to try and get that right. I imagine they'll sort it out. I mean, there were always conversations in the 90s that there was going to be strikes in the future at some stage. Um, that when they were trying to figure out what the game was like, you'd have hoped that that would have moved on at this stage. But I still think we're, we're suffering um, uh, the hangover from, from the COVID lockdowns. Um, uh, we've seen it in England with Worcester and Wasps. Now we're seeing it in Wales. Um, you know, I, I, th- I just think it's an incredibly difficult period of time for it. But you can imagine the the doubt when you're in a negotiation for your contract. And your contract's going to be up in a few months. And you don't know if you're going to have another job. So, I, I think a lot of things are going to have to change in Wales mm. for 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 the contracts to be sorted, but also to the the 60 um, cap rule to whether players have to play in 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 Wales to play for Wales. Um, I think everything is going to be on the table. Yeah, it's a it's a concerning situation. We'll definitely wait and see how that how that uh, materializes and whether or not that strike happens, and of course whether or not that England Wales game goes ahead. Certainly up in the air as things stand. Uh, Keith, great stuff as always. Thanks a million. Cheers, gents. Brilliant stuff. Keith Wood joining us as uh, as he usually does uh, on O2B AM, 8.47am on this Wednesday morning's O2B AM. And it is time for Virtual Insanity. You have entered Power Drive. Oh, wow! John Duggan, good morning. Shane and Nathan, how are we doing? Keeping well, good. keeping well. I always enjoy when the hat's on. Yeah, my mum my said it to me recently, she says there's, there's, a, there's an air of mysteriousness about John Duggan when he has the hat oh, yeah. on and down over the head. It's kind of a, to continue the Godfather theme, um, there's a bit of a Don Vito oh, Corleone about John Duggan, isn't there? Don Duggan, maybe? It's more of a hold all filter monopoly. What's the, re- what's the relevance of the hat this time, John? I just, uh, I think I need, Bad a, hair day. need a haircut. Is it a, what's a, what's, oh, it's a, what's the hat? It's the Breeders' Cup. Ah, uh, Breeders' Cup hat, sorry, of course. From We've Kentucky in November. We've seen it before. Yeah. Um, um, also, it's also a golf slap, so I look like uh, one of those American golfers who's come to Ireland on their vacation. Uh, and so, this is the Genesis Invitational. Starts tomorrow. The top six in the world in it. Tigers in it. going to be brilliant for the next four days. One of these uh, elite events on the PGA Tour in Los Angeles, formerly known as the Los Angeles Open in Riviera. Starts half two. Tomorrow, Irish time, we've done the podcast on the OTB network, on the Go Loud network. So, I have five golfers in the podcast. I've got two to give you today because uh, we want, obviously, people to listen as well as, as watch right now. But the headline tip is Rory this week at 9-1 to one for six each way of our virtual cash. Um, I think he probably will be a bit exasperated, Rory, that he is not the number one in the world given the way he's been playing so well in the last year, 18 months. And uh, that's just the, how tight it is at the top with Ram and obviously Scheffler now number one again. But uh, Rory's got a good record at Riviera. I'm looking, what, three times in the top 10 and six starts. I wouldn't be too worried about what happened in Phoenix last week. I think it was just a bit of rust. Remember, he did win in Dubai. So I don't think the game is in any kind of bad shape or anything. He's got a good record at the course. He's a good ball striker, which is what's required around here. And I think he'll have the fire in the belly. Uh, with the praise of Tiger Woods ringing in his ears uh, over the last 24 hours uh, to contend and be in the top eight, I think, uh, for a bit of profit for Rory McIlroy. 
uh, in the uh, Genesis Invitational. So he's the, the top-ranked player in terms of the virtual insanity pick this week. He's the headline pick. Uh, the other one is Cameron Young, a 30-1 to for three each way. Cameron Young, once again, didn't play very well in Phoenix, but once again, his penultimate start was a second, a tie for second at the Saudi International. So he was coming back from the Middle East, as was Rory. Cameron Young has got to do a bit better around the greens, uh, but if he can channel uh, that good performance a couple of weeks ago, I think he can definitely win on tour. Five times second last year, including in this event. Uh, was a elite player at the PGA and the Open Championship. Just needs that victory. Brilliant ball striker, hits it far. And I think generally, if you're looking past uh, winners of this event, you big hitters do generally tend to do well. Bubba Watson's won it, Dustin Johnson's won it. I think Cameron Young at 30-1 to 1 can give you a run, run for your money. I've got three outsiders picked. They're all on the podcast on the OTB network, which is now live. Brilliant stuff. John uh, Spurs last night, we had a comment in for our, from our resident Spurs OTB AM watcher and viewer Bobby Dwyer Spurs okay last night frustrating result control the game and Purr in the final third Kulisevsky and Son Purr no forward out ball for Kane all game two young lads did well in centre midfield still in the tie what's your assessment after last night uh, well, I don't want to be a miserable bee uh, on the show every time I talk about Spurs lads because <laughs> um, there's just no point in being miserable but uh, I, I, I felt that Milan are no great shakes they play with tenacity which I think is what won them the game uh, they defended quite well uh, there was definitely bright sparks from the likes of Sar and Skip uh, and actually Forster played okay. But there's, there's definitely a worry. I think Son is a shadow of, of the player he was last season. Um, Kulisevsky didn't have the best of games. I think Romero was too rash. He's now got, what, seven yellow cards in seven games. And uh, I just f- feel that um, I'm just tired. I'm just tired of the inconsistency, really. And like, I was just even like looking at the quotes from Antonio Conte in Italian after the game. I prefer to live in the present. I don't want to think about the future, but you know perfectly know that as an Italian man and the former Italy manager, Italy is in my heart. Italy will always stay there. I will never exclude that possibility. I'll be back here one day. Who knows? And that could be sooner rather than later. You know? Show me the money. Yeah, just I, I, like he's always flattering his eyelashes uh, every almost like every second game at at, at, at not being around. Spurs. You got to play the game though. Yeah, but a, a manager of uh, Antonio Conte's brilliance, both as a manager and as when he was a player, such a beautiful player in the middle of midfield, who's having to put Oliver Skip out in the last sixteen of the Champions League, like that's going to depress anybody. Yeah, <laughs> he must the most be like bang out. average midfielder. <laughs> well, I think he could have poor put- man Harry Winks. Did well last, did well last night. He was fine. Well, I think he could against put, the John's like not a great team. I think he could have put Richarlison out. Mm. Richarlison's the type of player you wanted to see there, a bit of fight, bit of bit of bit of dog, and uh, had a good World Cup, and hasn't hard like he hasn't scored in the league. You know, but I don't think he's got the chance to do so. I don't think Son is playing well enough to be in the team at the moment. Um, but they, they really are th- threadbare, Tottenham. Like Hoybier is injured now; he was obviously suspended yesterday. Uh, Basuma, Laris, uh, Sassignan. Benton core is a massive loss. Dyer will miss the second leg. Yeah, well, that's probably a good thing because uh, he has been dire. Um, the worry I have is that Pochettino will come back and Daniel Levy will get a free pass for not backing him in the transfer market five or six years ago. And it'll be all nostalgia time and the owners will get a free pass for the fact that they don't know how to run a football product. Brilliant business people, but don't know how to run a football product. It's just Groundhog Day waking up like that. It is, and that's why I said I don't want to be a miserable guy in the show saying the same thing uh, in, ad infinitum because on their day, as we saw in the City games, Spurs mm. on their day, but it, the consistency-wise, they can't Th- string it those together. Those performances are almost given a, a false, false yeah, yeah. ceiling of mm. because you're looking at them down at the table and going, whew. Jeez, they should be higher than where. Like, actually, top four is a decent finish for this yes. group yeah. of Spurs this group players. Of players. But yes. because every month they'll put in an outstanding performance, you go, oh, well, if, if you could just put a run of victories together, they could actually go and challenge for the title. But like, the Richarlison one is one of those signings that happens at clubs every so often where he's actually a very good signing and a very talented player, mm. but he doesn't fit into the system, system at yeah. all. Yeah. And he's on settled son at the start of the year it feels now maybe it's a deeper thing with young min son because it's continued but the slight move out of position for him like Kulisewski at the end of last season was arguably the best player in the Premier League and the amount he was creating for Harry Kane but something happened when Richarlison came in that both of those have had a big dip and look Kane will keep scoring goals because someone's going to have to score a goal eventually for them Yeah. but even Kane's overall level I don't think feels like it's where it was last season John with the hat on looks like a character from Moneyball to Zen TV. Um, yeah, potentially there's there's a few characters. A great film, by the way. It's called. It is a good film. It is a good film. Uh, there's a great story in the back of the, the Irish Daily Star. I'm sure the other papers as well. Arsenal and France legend Bakary Sanya has warned that Irish fans could score a big own goal by turning the Aviva Stadium into a cauldron of hate next month. Hate. Uh, Sanya reckons France are hated in Ireland because of the Thierry Henry handball over 13 years ago. 
He says, we are probably hated in Ireland. The fans will try to put the pressure on us. But the current generation of players don't have anything to do with it, so they might not feel the pressure. Do we hate France? Did he mention a British style of football? That's Ooh. usually what we get in articles like this. That's all we need. I don't think... We saw when Thierry Henry came this time last year with Belgium and his face went up on the big screen. There was uh, resounding boos. But is there... I don't, I don't think we hate France. I think we hate where we are. We hate that we're not qualifying and we hate that that's the last thing we can cling to in terms of being close to doing something. And we hate talking about Saipan because it's the last time we were oh, there. We're in, we're 2016. I, I think it's more about where we are as opposed to France. And France is just a symbol of that um, reality. It's not, it it's not you, it's me. Yeah, a bit, a bit, a bit like that. Um, I don't think anybody would have begrudged France if they won the World Cup, would they? Um, Call him Oani if he'd scored. Um, no, I, 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 don't, I don't think Irish fans really do hate anyway. I just, I just love I the fact we, that, no, I think if I, some random lad from Rangers turns up playing for the opposition, then then there's a bit of hatred. But that's as far <laughs> as it ever goes. I think we're more concerned about what we'll do. Will Evan Ferguson mm. be fit to start? Will he play? Um, what's the vibe around the team? Um, what's the Abba Femi scored last night? Yeah, I think there's a yep. weird fascination now when these big teams come because Ireland have dropped so far. Of Mbappe is in town. There's a yeah. genuine excitement mm. among a lot of probably younger Irish supporters of getting to see this guy in the flesh <laughs> and getting to see some of those incredibly talented French players as much as you know a lot of these people Thierry Henry's 15 years ago some kids don't know him 15 years ago thing. yeah yeah Ah, it's terrifying. Monday, twenty seventh of March. That's the the game against the French in Dublin. So uh, looking forward to that. Any Nathan other... was there. He did the he did the he did the award winning report. Oh, you, you cursed us, Nathan. Well, yeah, well, generally when I go, bad things happen. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Uh, any other bits happening, John? Uh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, full swing. I don't know if you've seen the sneak preview yet, yeah. Nathan. I've seen the whole thing. Have you? Yes, I just got my review this morning already. Damning, damning. They're damning saying. Damning indictment. Uh, I think I think you'll watch it. I think you'll find it passable and oh, okay. a nice way to spend an evening. But there's, it's very top line. Right. It's, okay. Uh, That's disappointing. Nice and sweet. And uh, the last episode, the Rory episode, is the most interesting one. But this, it's not good. Can you jump to the Rory episode, bit. or do you have to watch it from the start? Uh, no, you don't. You could jump straight to okay. the Rory episode. I say, each one is. If you're a golf fan, you'll find a little nugget of something in each of okay. them, and it's. A fine p- way to pass forty-five yeah, minutes. I, I think. Um, it, nice. I think if you're a golf nice. nut, it's like the Mickelson book. I found disappointing because I knew so much already. Mm. I think maybe for people who don't watch golf, maybe that'll be the thing. Mm. Yeah, I. Alt- I think they've all fallen down into the problem of what are they appealing to. So I don't think it'll mass. I don't think there's going to be. Well, we drive to survive of level extra of, people yeah, watching right. the Genesis this week. I think it'll do great things for someone like Joel Damon who. Okay. Uh, and Tony Fee now, right. who maybe don't have that wider appeal where people will now know them and know their story and Joel Damon will no longer be the world number 70. He'll have a far bigger yeah. profile than that. But okay. it's not going to do much for Justin Thomas or you know Rory. Yeah, just a shout out to Billy Morgan. I don't know if you've mentioned him already. 78 years of age uh, on the line for UCC tonight against UL in the Sickerson Cup final at WIT half seven throw. And what a amazing life story in GA, giving it back still, imparting that wisdom to younger generations and just fantastic story. All Ireland winning goalkeeper, captain, 1973. What we're talking, what uh, 50 years ago this year for Cork, uh, manager in '89 and '90. Just brilliant to see. Yeah, absolute legend, worth a mention for sure. John, great stuff as always. Alright, lads. Thank you. Uh, Eight fifty-seven a.m. on this uh, Wednesday morning's OTBM. Up next, Kathleen McNamee and her Republic of Ireland women's power rankings. First, Kathleen herself spoke with Eva Mannion yesterday about growing up surrounded by Irish culture throughout her parents. Take a look. Yeah, so my my parents met in England. They, they were obviously um, from Ireland. They met in England. They'd moved over for work. Um, and so they came over and sort of joined an Irish community in Birmingham, hence why my sister grew up in the in Irish dancing community. Um, I played Gaelic uh, locally at a little team called Shaw McDermott's and then for Warwickshire as well. Um, and so all of the Irish traditions, um, Gaelic, um, Irish dancing, going to mass, everything like that has felt like quite traditional. Um, obviously, I've been born in England, but apart from that, all of my family are actually Irish and from Ireland. And so when I got the call up last week, I can't tell you how many messages I've had from family members saying, you know, how exciting that is to be part of it. Um, so really, I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever seen my, my parents so proud of anything that I've ever done. And I've sort of been around football for a little while now and been managed to be involved in a few bits. And I must say, I think that if they died tomorrow, that they, they would probably be happy. <laughs> That's how excited they are. So um, it's quite like an exciting time for me personally. 
Yep, minute to nine on this Wednesday morning's O2 AM, brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Kathleen McNamee, good morning. Good morning, guys. You've got the Irish, uh, the Irish jacket on for the for the occasion. Nice retro number there. Yeah, I was half like, you know, you'd say to dress for the job you want, but after doing this power rankings, I'm like, no, I never want to be a manager because it is entirely you painful. Feel your Vera Pow when you pull on the, <laughs> uh, the jacket. That's what I was trying to channel, but I just, I don't think I'm cutthroat enough. Like, I, how many times was I sitting in the last like 24 hours and I kind of, you know, I do up a list and then I'd be like, no, oh, move that person in. And I'm like, oh, I forgot this person and put them in, and then I'm like, who do I take out? So yeah, it was a. Uh, a restless 24 hours. I also say I felt I felt like I needed a bit more time with it just to properly settle on it. Mm. But we'll be doing these a few times before the World Cup, anyway. For so. myself and and yourself, Kathleen, it's a, it's a retro jacket. For for Nathan, it's just a jacket. <laughs> mm. Do you know what I mean? Top top banter. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, I I wanted Ashley or Kathleen Ashley Kathleen uh, to do this uh, <laughs> because we spoke about it with um, Shabana Hearn last week of the makeup of this squad mm. that Vera Pau had brought. 28 players to Scotland for the playoff game. There were five real mainstays of the squad injured and they've added in, as we see this week, two new players and maybe even a couple more to come at some stage between now and the World Cup. So suddenly you're going to have probably at least 10 players who have played a big part in qualification not even making the squad. Yeah, it's difficult like I was looking through some of the past teams from like the qualification and even like the Euros failed qualification and you do just forget how many players have been involved getting to this point and we've talked about it a bit when we did qualify against Scotland everyone was kind of talking to the players afterwards and like oh you're going to a World Cup but you don't know if those players are going to go to a World Cup anything from an injury to I don't know a poor run of form or like a lot of these players on the Irish squad at the moment aren't starting for their clubs which is slightly worrying in terms of you know just being match fit and match sharp um it was interesting the change in tone Vera Powell had about that during her press conference because during qualification she was very much you need to be playing for your club and if you need to leave your current club to go somewhere else to be playing mm. it's vital but obviously now <sighs> heading towards a world cup she has a certain group of players that she needs in the squad that some of them aren't playing it was a lot more well, you know, we'll work with the players. We've got a lot of camps and it'll all be fine. Mm. But some of them will certainly miss out if they don't play any football, you'd That's imagine, at club level over the next three, four months. Definitely. Has uh, that played into your decision making, Kathleen, in terms of uh, there are some of those players, as Nathan says, who, who aren't playing that you need you need to include anyway? Like you're, mm. you're not going to leave Katie McCabe or someone out who's not playing regularly at club level at the moment, but it still is a concern. Yeah, it factored in probably with some more than others, a bit like you're saying, you know, Katie McCabe hasn't started the last three games for Arsenal. Goodness knows why anyone who's a regular listener to Koi Gig will know that we basically have a, we almost have a Katie McCabe isn't playing segment every week now at this stage because we're just so baffled by the decision. Um, but then there are other players who maybe are in the championship or playing a bit lower down. And like the other thing as well, like the Women's National League hasn't come back yet either. So a lot of those players aren't playing at the moment. Their season is finished up and it's a bit hard to know if you were to send a squad tomorrow, which of those players are the ones that are going to be the standout players? You know, you're kind of basing it on what they were doing at the end of last year. Um, and I don't know if that fed into, the, like, I think there's only two players in the squad that have gone over to Marbella from the league, which obviously you'd like to see a few more than that. Uh, mm. I don't think it's just a sign of the fact that a lot more Irish players are going over to the WSL and the championship. I think, you know, there probably should be a couple more names in in there, especially at this early stage, anyways. Uh, so talk us through. This. So this is the power rankings as if the as if you were picking the squad today for the for the women's World Cup later this year, essentially. Yeah. And so it's tw- twenty three. It's twenty three player squad. Twenty three player squad. I was so convinced when I was doing this yesterday. I kind of like I wrote out a rough list of all the names. I didn't even rank them. I was just like <laughs> names that are coming into my head, and I was like, that's definitely less than twenty three, and it was thirty four. Ah. <laughs> So, so that's how difficult the decision it is. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I mean, it should be 26. Every single country wants 26, but FIFA said no, so that's unfortunate. But um, yeah, so number one, we have Ms. Denise O'Sullivan. This is one of the situations where, how do you rank Katie McCabe? She's second, and Denise O'Sullivan. Clip that bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tag them. Katie, put, Katie stick, it on the, stick it on the dressing room wall. I gave it. I gave one. it to Denise. I. I mean, you, they sh- really should be shared number one because you can't really like this Ireland squad doesn't operate without either of them. I don't think to the ability that we do. But the reason I gave it to Denise was obviously she got named captain of North Carolina Courage this week. 
Katie hasn't played in a couple of games. There's talk that she had a chest infection and that's why, even though she played 120 minutes in the Conti Cup. So that was the only reason for the difference between the two of them. They're still two of my favourite players out there. Uh, third, Louise Quinn. Fourth, Neef Fahey. Fifth, Megan Campbell. Sixth, Megan... Or, sorry, five, Megan Connolly. Six, Megan Campbell. Seven, Courtney Brosnan. Eight, Lily Ag. Nine, Heather Payne. Ten, Amber Barrett. And eleven, Rusha Littlejohn. So mm. not necessarily a starting eleven, but... Well, it's the 11 it's best players that we the have. the 11 at the top. And then so you think even though Risha Littlejohn's been injured for the last three or four months, there's no doubts? Uh, I don't think so. So my slight doubts with Risha is obviously Lily I came in in that position and she's actually been performing incredibly well the last while. Um, and she has, you know, she's been scoring in the Champions League three goals in her last 10 games or something. Mm. And she's really come into her own. Since, and it's, pretty much happened since she came in for Rusha. Um, so I think her confidence is an all-time high and I really think she could be an important player for us in the next couple of months if she continues her form in the championship. With Rusha, I do think that she does give us something and I think that like week on week, she is increasing her minutes in the WSL. You know, she started coming on towards the end of the 90 minutes and now she's slowly going towards like the 70 60, and I think she will keep backing that up. She also has the added advantage of being in the WSL rather than the championship, so she is playing at a slightly more competitive level. Um, and I think where she left off, I know in the last game she played, it was Finland, the game she got injured in, wasn't it? She was injured for a lot of that, and she wasn't great. I thought Vera Powell should have probably taken her off mm. a bit earlier. Um, but I think up until that point, she was quite a stalwart in the team. And I see why. So we're going to name then from 12 on to, to 23 now, but the, the, I, the, there's a chance that a lot of these players could actually be in the starting lineup because, as you say, it's you're picking your your best players, not necessarily by position. So so who, who, who else makes the squad? So at 12, with Jamie Finn, 13, Anya Gorman, 14, Lucy Quinn, 15, Diane Caldwell, 16, Harriet Scott, 17, Kyra Carusa, 18, Abby Larkin, 19, Leanne Kiernan, 20, Chloe Mustaki, 21, Eva Mannion, and then at 22 and 23, we have our two reserve goalies in Grace Maloney and Megan Walsh, which just shows <laughs> what mm. I think about the goalkeepers at the moment in the squad. Yeah. Uh, do you have to, I suppose you have to bring three, three goalkeepers, don't you? You do, and the thing that kind of got me with this is that like there are other options, and like I do have other shouts, but it's like someone like Eve Badana has been in and out of the squad. She's never started. She's kind of always that like fourth added on, but with the league not playing at the moment, it's hard. Like she was top keeper in the league last year, so that is definitely a shout for her. The thing with Grace and Megan at the moment, like. They're both barely in their squads. Megan has most recently been dropped for Lydia Williams, who came in to Brighton from PSG. So she conceded, Lydia Williams conceded six at the weekend, but before that, uh, Megan Walsh had uh, conceded 33 goals across the whole season, which was the most of any team. Now, Brighton are a shambles in general, so it can't all be put on her. And then Grace Maloney has been in and out of the Reading squad pretty much since we qualified against Scotland. Um, Jacqueline Burns from Northern Ireland has been in there too. And they also have the second worst goal record in the league. So it's been a tough time. Even, even like Courtney Brosnan, you know, when I was doing the power rankings, I think part of re- the reason of having Courtney Brosnan up so high was almost a loyalty out of, to her as well because she hasn't been starting for Everton this season. Emily Ramsey has and now Emily Ramsey is getting into the England squad for the first time. But when Courtney Brosnan did play uh, against United two weekends ago now, she played amazingly. And the only reason she was in the team was because Emily Ramsey couldn't because she was on loan from United. So, you know, whenever I see Courtney play, she plays really well. It's just the fact she's not consistent. And like I've talked to Emma Byrne about this quite a lot. And she is, much like Vera Powell, one of those people who says, you know, you need to be playing all the time. You need to be playing all the time. And in the last couple of months, she's like slightly, ch- not changed her tune, but with Courtney, she's like, you know, she hasn't been playing consistently, but whenever she does play, she plays quite good. So m- maybe that suits her in mm-hmm. a certain way. Um, but you have to have a good mentality, I think, to be a player like Courtney. and not be playing the minutes that you are and still be able to pull out performances. Uh, 
you have Aoife Mannion in your squad we just heard from her yesterday and she's in all the papers today talking about you know incredibly strong Irish links it's very much down the Kevin Kilban route of grew up in an Irish community in the Irish centre played Gaelic football preferred Gaelic football to soccer wouldn't even went to school with uh, Jack Grealish but wouldn't and mention wouldn't mention the name of uh, <laughs> the GA team that Jack Grealish played for and of course more importantly than all she's from Mayo Mayo um, and Galway there's, there's well, both. but she's Mayo definitely football, pushing Galway she's pushing more head. towards the Mayo side is what I got from right. her press conference yesterday from uh, Clock Jordan she's just from outside Kilmaine and uh, her uncle was uh, Pat Kelly I presume it's Pat Kelly that played for Vincent's and is, uh, was around the Mayo squad over the last few years you have her in the squad so the Irish back three is unbelievably experienced I can't imagine to be a more experienced back three uh, I think Louise Quinn is the baby of the group and she'll be 34 by the time uh, the World Cup starts is there a possibility that Aoife Mannion can put some pressure to not just make the squad but even make the team I think so I remember watching her when she played at City and she's been incredibly unfortunate with injuries and like frantically googling her firstly because of her name and secondly because she was playing really really well at that stage as a possible, like, does she have any Irish links? Could she come over? I think it was around the time where she was starting to get called into the England squad, so I was like, mm, maybe we've already lost her. Mm. I, I do think she can challenge. I think it's going to be incredibly difficult for her because obviously she is coming off the back of that ACL injury. So that I think she got that February last year and she just started back into the United squad January of this year and she's still on the bench it, it, like it, it's tough to break into this United squad as well because they're very settled and obviously doing quite well because they're top of the WSL table I think why I included Aoife Mannion was as you say that back line is getting on a little bit as much as you know don't want to say that about them but they are and I think she's the sort of player that we need now looking into like Nations League Euro qualifiers you know we need to make sure we have that line of succession there so that we're not left if any of those players decide to re retire after the World Cup or in the next year or so we're not left floundering because realistically it has been such a strong part of our game is that back three and we need to make sure that we have the people there that can go in and I do think she could be a good option now she's not gonna she's quite small so she's not going to have that like dominance in the air of, say, someone like Louise Quinn. But she is very good at one-on-one -on -one situations. She's very good at taking the ball up the pitch herself, which is something that Ireland sometimes aren't all that great at. We do like a bit of a, a hoof the ball up and see where it goes. Um, so I think that connection with the midfield could be really good for us in the future. If, I mean, I said so many times before, I'd love to see this Irish team actually play a bit of football and you know have a bit of confidence with the ball at their feet and not just consistently have that helter skelter and we're definitely getting better at it but there is just still that little bit of a chink in our armor and um, so yeah I think I definitely do think she could compete for a place I don't know if she'd go straight into the starting lineup because Vera is quite loyal but I definitely think she put a bit of pressure. I like the I like the mix of youth and experience in that twenty three. I have to say, this is the part though, uh, briefly, Kathleen, that that would have kept you awake at night. The players that did not make your squad. So so who's left out? Yeah, so uh, there was about twenty of them. I won't lie, <laughs> and actually mostly it was players from the league here because I did feel a bit bad that I didn't include that many of them because I do think there are some really great players here. Um, so you're like the Jesse Stapleton. Rihanna Jarrett, who's just moved back to Wexford, never been favoured by Vera Powell all that much, but I think if she could regain the form she found just before she left, she could be on something. Eva Dana, who we talked about before, in goals. Uh, this is like, I'm not really sure where she's at with her injury, and I think she probably won't be recovered fully in time, because I think she had, she did her ACL in September, but a player like Ella Malloy, I would love to see more of. Mm. Um, Isabel Atkinson didn't make it just because she's not getting a whole lot of time at West Ham at the moment, which is really unfortunate. Uh, Neve Farley, who scored her first goal in Italy at the weekend. Very nice goal. Don't know if either of you saw it on Twitter. Mm. It was like volley from kind of just outside the box. Goalkeeper should have done. Italian as well in her post-match press yeah, conference. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah? yeah. Give it the Ta best shot. an Italian theme to, to today's show, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Have you got a... a uh, is uh, there pizzas coming in soon or a bit of pasta? <laughs> the Godfather reference the for... The Aussies uh, will be swimming at the fishes by the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, Savannah McCarthy 
was someone who started the campaign as part of that back three and mm. signed for Shamrock Rovers now. <clears throat> somebody who obviously Vera Pau does trust. I guess it's just a case of fitness. Yeah, I think that was my thing with her was fitness. Kathleen doesn't trust her. Kathleen doesn't trust her. <laughs> well, no, that's the thing because I was looking at the old teams and I was like, I had half forgotten how much of a regular starter she was in the squad and how much Vera Powell did actually trust in her because she has been out injured for so long. Mm. Um, I do think it's going to be a bit of a journey back for her. Mm. And that was kind of my main reason for leaving her. I mean, like, I would love it if she came back because she was, she was great when she was playing. And when she got her injury, that was such a massive blow for us at the time. And since then, we've gone through about three or four massive blows with the big injuries that we have. Um, which is really unfortunate because, like I said, I would love more players who are playing in the league here in the squad. You know, someone like, we get this a lot on Koi Gig, people asking us, well, why is Abby Larkin in the squad with someone like Emily Corbett, who played with Athlone, isn't, and was one of the top scorers in the league last year? Which is like a fair enough question. She hasn't yeah. been called in as of yet. So, What about the complete outsiders then to wrap it? So, Marissa Shiva is in the squad. I think she's going to be doing. Uh, her media duties so we'll learn a bit more about her today mm-hmm. and I did hear, hear you on Koi Gig there seemed to be a suggestion that because there's a training camp this month there's another one in April and then like they're together for about six weeks before the tournament mm. even starts yeah. so there is time to integrate people and there's so obviously been work done in the background around passports and Vera Powell said right at the start we're getting lots of calls <laughs> like there is that balance of you don't want to unsettle the squad already there you're leaving out a lot of players who've been around the squad never mind uh, more of them uh, Marissa Shiva and her chances are anybody else of coming in I think Marissa Shiva the reason I she's kind of like on the edge for me is just because I haven't watched her play all that much over the last year I've seen a couple of her appearances for Washington Spirit but I think she only played um, 302 minutes last year so that was about 8 games and the two ninety minutes that she played were during international windows so she was kind of like stepping in for players who were gone I think she could be really like she was really good at college level. Um, she played with Penn State and like played like ninety two times I think over that time. I think what she could add is, as Emma Byrne was saying, that sort of American athleticism, the kind of the sort of running you see the likes of Denise O'Sullivan and Heather Payne do, who and even someone like Cara Caruso who've grown up in that very very athletic. You know, you have to cover as much of the pitch as possible sort of place I think that could be good for us because we don't have a lot of that especially with players who want to attack going forward and if there's someone who can keep pace with the likes of Denise or who can do a nice little one-two switch up with Heather Payne Mm. I'm totally I totally think that would be great but I just would be interested to see if she does play in this camp or in one of the following camps how she actually fits into that squad and you know what sort of relationship she can develop with the players that are already there in midfield I think great stuff you, we'll, uh, we'll let you relax after that I know it was a stressful experience trying to I'm pick going a squad home now. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> and we'll, we'll look we'll, we'll recap it just before the World Cup and see how your uh, your personnel have changed between now and then uh, great stuff as always Cathy thanks a million for that uh, so it is uh, 17 minutes past nine on this Wednesday morning's OTB AM. Here's what we've got coming up on OTB Sports Radio across the rest of today. 1 o'clock, OTB Gold with Emmanuel Petit. 3 p.m. it is Koi Gig. 4 p.m. it's our retro panel on sport and the rising. 6 p.m. OTB Gold inside Harrington's Gaff. And then 7 p.m. of course the show live this evening with Joe, Wednesday Night Rugby, plenty more besides as well. You can follow OTB across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in the latest sports content. Here is a clip now coming up from the latest episode of The Football Pod where Paddy, James and Tommy talked about the Sigerson Cup, the football pod in a partnership with AIB, proud po- uh, sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. After the break, the ex-Waterford hurler, Kevin Moran. OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball OTB GAA uh, well, it was wide, like, you know, everybody, I don't know how many thousand people were, were here today, but I'd say, I'd say every one of them thought it was wide except the umpire, but anyway, so look, that's, that's what happens when you, when you, you know, when you weigh grounds, you don't tend to get breaks. Subscribe to the OTBGAA podcast feed, wherever you get your podcasts. The thing yeah. is, though, I, I, it's such a romanticised competition to Sigerson. But should it not be though? You're just happy. You had a bad experience. You should have come to DC. When you watch it, it's it's 
it's not good like oh, I disagree I love Secrets of Football that's, uh, every Secrets in game I've watched has been uh, has tell been you what those, the conditions are okay. yeah uh, and it's ever, a load of that. reasons brought into it yeah conditions are definitely one of the main ones but it's it's not it's not it's not good like I, I know enjoy they should it. do with the Secrets in every year they should play in Boston every should be the weekend <laughs> they always play that in the dome Oh, that's a great shot. That, that could be, be good, that yeah. could be it. Move the Sigerson to the dome. I remember in January. playing Sigerson Cup games, lads. Hang on. The dome. What Can't surface see. is the dome? Astro. Yeah. There'll be war. Well, all the FPD league games get played there. Play it in the dome, and then you spend the weekend in Galway after them. Yeah, the yeah. That 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 could be the right incentive. That could be the yeah, answer. Yeah. And then just to, to mention I mean, the US team. I told you. Top only. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, welcome back to OTB AM. Now delighted to be joined by the former Waterford hurler and Electric Ireland Fitzgibbon Cup winner with WIT, Kevin Moran, as he looks ahead to the Electric Ireland Fitzgibbon Cup semi-finals and final this weekend. This year, through its hashtag first class rivals campaign, Electric Ireland celebrated the unexpected alliances formed between county rivals as they come together in pursuit of some of the most coveted titles across Camogie and GEA. Kevin, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Keeping well, keeping well. Thanks for joining us as uh, as usual. Uh, look, this this is a tournament that you, that you would have played in back in the day yourself, as we mentioned. So it's 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 not easy playing against uh, County teammates and county rivals. You're playing with county rivals essentially as well. So it's a strange dynamic, but an exciting one. Yeah, very exciting. And um, as I said, when I when I look back on my fond memories, it's um, played it for a few years in what was known as WIT uh, back in. We're lucky enough to win it in 2006 and 2008, and did did a stint then with UCC while I was doing my post grad. So it's um, yeah, some some great memories. And um, look semi-finals and finals in, in the next couple of days and you know there's a good old buzz here around Warford and look I know they're up against it against UL but you know a really prestigious competition and you know it's great to have it on its on our doorstep here and um, uh, tomorrow night I think the last time you were on with us potentially Kevin was was just after you announced your, your retirement you're on with Nathan uh, talk about what it meant to you to, to hang up the hurl how, how do you how does it sit with you now to be I guess an ex county hurler. Yeah, look, it, you know, I guess last year it was really the first year, and you know the lads were flying it and they won the league and things like that. And you're you're kind of you, you do miss it, let's be honest. But you know, I went to every game. I didn't kind of hide away from it. I just went as a supporter, and I suppose I'm after finding my place in the stand, and um, you know, nice and comfortably, and just you know, like anybody else, going to supporting the team, but. You know, the, I suppose the void at the start of, of missing training and things like that. And um, after a while, I, I got myself busy in other areas and a bit coaching and you know trying to be involved with the club as much as I can. So, uh, yeah, look, just looking forward to the year ahead with the lads again. Um, you know, as again as a supporter and um, yes, yeah, so a good start for them over the first two games. But look, bigger challenges and hopefully a long year to come. There's a touch of the Sky Sports news turning up at every Roy Keane press conference about Davy Fitz and whatever county he goes to. Suddenly there's a real media glare on every little thing that happens. Uh, you mentioned sitting in the stands and watching the games as a supporter now. Uh, under Davy Fitz, you never know, there could be another uh, opportunity for you because he does like to have different people around different parts of the stadium. This was a big talking point after the weekend of having a coach behind the goal, getting the ball back quickly and maybe just trying to spot something uh, different. What, firstly, what's your take on, on that and uh, yeah. what benefit there is to it? Yeah, look, I think Davey, look, he, he's exploring all angles as best as he can just to try and improve things. You know, I don't see a huge problem with it. You know, the opportunity is there at the moment. Look, it might be there in bigger matches as the year go ahead. So, you know, he's a new management, he's his new style and, you know, I guess he's trying to point out some things to maybe show on our Billy as it was over the over the last couple of games to you know maybe get the ball back into play maybe to spot some runs and things like that and I think when it was put to him after the match against Leash there on, on on Saturday evening I think he answered it excellently you know he said he's just trying to bring the professionalism to it you know there's no reason why you know people in the stand and, and on the sideline can't shoot shout instructions and things like that so why not give a little bit more of kind of an in-depth, kind of closer relationship with the goalkeeper coach that it looks like. And um, Is there no danger of a information overload for the goalkeeper, for Sean O'Brien, that, you know, you've done your training during the week, you've put your game plan into action, and now 
even when you go out on the pitch, it doesn't end. You're still, like, should he not be making those decisions? Yeah, look, I suppose there is a bit of that, you know. I know, it, 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 look, if there's some noise in your ear, it, it can be frustrating. But I, I would think it's, you know, I wouldn't think it's every single pocket. I think it's kind of quick messaging. And you know what? It could be a, it could be a thing that um, the goalkeeper coach wants to see what the movement is like from 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 Sean's position, maybe from his viewpoint. So, uh, look, you're right. It, it can't, you don't want information overload. And it, it, it can be, you know, it can be quite... A difficult task as it is to, you know, to to see what's in front of you, to be talking, to to be communicating. But uh, look, the lads are obviously working on things in training, and um, you know, why why not if if they can use it as best they can? What's he like as a manager in uh, in training, Kevin? Yeah, look, Dave, Dave, Davey, uh, Davey, Davey was very good to me. Uh, he you know gave me a lot of confidence uh, when he came in in two thousand and eight as a young player, and you know it's uh, it's actually interesting he. You know, it's going quite well with the Fitz, with W eighteen, the Fitzgibbon, and you know, it gave me that platform to you know to build. And you know, I think he puts huge value into Fitzgibbon himself. So you know, he understands a, 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 what a good competition it is, and you know, it's a real stepping stone, I suppose, for the next step up of senior inter county hurling. But as a manager, he's you know he's top class. Um, uh, uh, you know, he's very very professional. I think any players. That have worked on them will say that his setup will be top class. He'll be always working on things, you know, like we're discussing at the moment. I think he's good for the game. I think, you know, he brings that, you know, people are talking about him, the media are interested in him, he gives good interviews, the players are happy. So the more the more we see of him, the better, I think. But I think he'll have water in, you know, in you know, good condition for, you know, when they need to. And um, look, they obviously it's early in the season and they're you know, they've won their first couple of games, but there's there's massive tasks ahead and hopefully come, you know, April, May, June is when they really hit the ground running. But yeah, no, he's um I I have a lot of good time from very good players manager and I suppose one good trade just looking back through through his time with Watford, Clare, Wexford, um he, he seems to get the best out of players and you know that's that's a real confidence booster for the squad and you know you have to kind of admire a guy who can do that just going to pause for one second Kevin and uh, just improve the quality of your line just for just for one moment uh, is Davy Fitz a manager you, you hypothetically would like to have like as you said there's a there's a, a certain circus that follows him around uh, it probably depends where you are in your life mm. cycle as a team you know I think listening to a lot of the interviews with Waterford players there did seem to be a sense that maybe they weren't taking enough personal responsibility about their failings last mm. season you know they go they win the league they win it convincingly and then they don't even get out of Munster that like look at yourselves first it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a change in manager that should have to spark something yeah uh, you know as somebody on the outside listen anytime Davy Fitz is involved as I say this is a talking point in a league that it sort of feels it's very hard to read anything into what's happening on the pitch, so we're sort of looking for these side shows to keep us interested. Yeah, Kevin, we have you you back on the line there. Sorry, just wanted to improve that line for a second. And um, when you look at this this Waterford team, the this is a, a, a I guess the nucleus of this current crop wins a, a minor in twenty thirteen, wins a twenty one All Ireland in, in twenty sixteen. So there's a little bit of pressure on Davy Fitz in that now is the time where where this Waterford team should be coming to fruition at senior level. Yeah, look, absolutely. It's um, you know they're a really good group of players. I suppose the, the 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 nucleus of the team is, as you mentioned, that minor and under twenty one team that was so successful. And you know a lot of those guys are still there. And look, I think Davies kind of trying to hold them as best as he can for the latter stage of the league and obviously the Munster Championship. And you know tied in with a little bit of you know youth like Patrick Fitzgerald and Ruben Halloran and Patrick Fitzgerald and that and it is a nice mix but no I do agree I think there is, there is a bit of pressure as in I'm not going to say it's now or never but and I, I you know Liam and Mikey Bevins did a great job and you know it, obviously it finished the way it finished but I think Davy was the perfect fit to you know the there was no need for rebuilding and for you know a lot of trial matches and things like that to build your panel I think everyone knows what the bulk of the team is going to be and it's just trying to you know get it right with those those good players that we still have at our disposal what does the league mean now to, to a player kevin like you you look at that water team of course we said we mentioned one that won the league a couple of years ago and then or last year and then and then the championship comes around and it's disappointment so if you're flying high at the end of the league you just you can't get excited anymore it's not like the the football league where i guess positions in the league now determine things in relation to the championship so is it tough to get excited about the league at the moment in hurling? 
yeah, no. In, in fairness, it is. Look, the matches are good, but I suppose when you when when you stand back from it, win, lose, or draw, you're kind of saying, you know, how important is it? Look, every team is trying to peak for for their respective provincial championships, and you know, th those are everything. Because if if you're not in that top three, you're you know gone the end of May or the start of June, and look, it's a long summer ahead. So it is a hard one. Look, I know, I know, it didn't work out for Ward for last year, and they were absolutely flying. You know they won the league very very comprehensively and i suppose the trajectory of their uh, of, of their you know the how well they were playing just kind of gradually fell and you know they they just kind of looked looked like they were really out on their feet towards the you know towards the end of the monster championship but look who's to say you know maybe that was just we're, i suppose we're just going on the data point of last year and um, you know it did not work out but and um, who's to say they're you know they can't turn the tables this year and you know someone goes and has a good league and wins the, the league and you know goes on and wins wins the monster Leicester championship but i suppose you know you'd be changing your mind and saying look well their league form was good uh you know it was obvious that they're going to play well but no certainly it is, it is a it is a hard one you know i'd say ma managers are kind of you know they're very kind of cautious at the moment they don't want to be going too well they don't want to be going too bad if they are going too well can they maintain it so you know it's all a balancing act and you know you really don't know until you have two or three games in, in the monster and Leicester championships under your belt to say well this actually worked or, or things like that so you know it is a very hard one and um, does it take from the prestige of the league possibly and um, because i know when i was playing it was you know it was such a brilliant competition and you know everyone was you know, mad to win it, and then you had your kind of four, five, six, possibly even eight week break to go up to the first round of the Monster Championship. But the turnaround is so, you know, it's so small, it's a couple of weeks. And um, I guess different teams have different kind of agendas and progress with regard to where they are. It's uh, interesting reading Martin Brehney just in the in the Irish Independent this morning, uh, Kevin. He's talking about the uh, the changing face of hurling scoring over the over the years and over the decades. The average total of points per championship game it just on the way up. And the number of goals per game just on the way down. You're seeing these high-scoring games, even last weekend in the league. I think he's making the point of the average. The average scores were were very, very high uh, in terms of ball going over the bar. Like, have you noticed anything that that needs to be changed in the game? Like Martin is making in points here. You know, sh asking questions essentially: Should the ball be heavier? Should the value of goals be increased to four or even five points to encourage more of them? Like, is there anything the game needs to to I guess get rid of that just shootout that 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 we've seen in, in hurling recently? Yeah, yeah, look, it, you know, I, I suppose players are so good and comfortable on the ball nowadays and the slitter is definitely a little bit lighter. Yeah, I would love to see a little bit more kind of particularly high balls going into danger areas in around, you know, the, the D or the uh, the edge of the square and, and, you know, more goals, you know, more goals being created and things like that. At the moment, it's just a lot of teams are, I would say, uh, they're, they're putting their players out the field. They're, I won't say blanket defensive, but they're, you know, that middle third is fairly congested. And every team seems to be working on just breaking that line and being comfortable with taking their score from 40, 50 metres out. Look, players in inter-county level nowadays, that's a walk in the park for a lot of them. You know, I know there was a lot of wides in the Kilkenny and Tipperary game. Again, it could be an adjustment to the ball, but is the ball too light? Um, I'm not so sure. I just think that I, I just think that the, the quality of the player striking has just increased so much. Um, and I, I do agree, though, I would love to see kind of more goal opportunities coming, you know, putting that ball into in, in, into the edge of the square, seeing a lot more kind of, you know, aerial duels and, and, and feeling and things like that. I think that's something that we all long for. But, you know, the game is constantly evolving, um, you know, going from sweepers to running games to all about tackling, you know, who's to say you won't see a kind of different... A different approach to a team this year. I, I did notice Bally Hale this year with the in the All Ireland club, like they're just a real, you know, A to B type of hurling team, really putting the ball into the danger positions and you know creating a lot of goal opportunities. So, um, you know, who, some some teams might do it, some teams won't. I, I do think Limerick have changed a little bit this year in their approach. Uh, Tipperary, you can see what they're trying again. Cork are just you know an awful lot of shooters out the field. And, and, and Waterford could be, you know, possibly the same. But uh, look, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, we I think we'd all love to see two, two or three more goals and maybe, you know, seven or eight less points. I think it it, it bring a, a far more exciting spectacle to it. Finally, for me, Kevin, uh, how do you see the the season playing out? And I, well, I guess how do you stop Limerick is the question. Yeah, look, yeah, that's a big question. Like, 
look, there is a there is a possibility that they could be even better and stronger than last year. And I was very impressed with them in their first two league games this year. I know Cork got the better of them in the end, but they just seem so comfortable what they're doing. Um, they're you know they're coached absolutely excellently. They're very comfortable on the ball. And I just think when it comes to it, you know, in All-Ireland semi-finals and finals and it's going down the stretch, I do think they have such composure and confidence in what in, in what has worked for them. But look, the chase and pack, I think everyone knows, you know, the chase and pack's impossible to say who's number two, three, four, you know, the, it could change from week to week. But I do think there is a gap. Hopefully that gap will close and um, someone like Warford might get a chance to dethrone him. But at the moment, look, you would have to say there's, it's going to take a monumental effort from some team to to um, to bring down Limerick. They're, they're flying on all cylinders. They're getting, you know, hurlers of the years, all-stars back from last year who weren't even playing. You know, there doesn't seem to be any complacency. They're bringing in younger players who can just fit in. And um, look, it looks a little bit ominous, but... And um, look, we'll see. Yeah, sport is, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen, and hopefully it'll lead to, you know, a really good hurling championship. But um, at this moment in time, I would have to say Limerick are really going to be difficult to stop. Kevin, great to catch up as always. Thanks a million. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on. Brilliant, Kevin Moore in there, the former, former Waterford hurler, two time All Star as well. Uh, of course, looking ahead to the Fitzgibbon Cup uh, semi finals and finals in the Electric Ireland Fitzgibbon Cup this weekend. Uh, Nathan, we, we only briefly touched on it, I think, with, with John Duggan earlier, but Obafemi and Robinson on the score sheet last night. I mean, it's it's not a bad time for them to start scoring. Uh, no, because it's probably two from Robinson, Obafemi, and Ferguson that will start against France. You'd have to imagine Jason Knight will play as say one of the front three but actually playing a little bit deeper than that like Callum Robinson's playing the struggling Cardiff team uh, hadn't scored since before Christmas I think he'd gone eight games without a goal missed mm. a penalty recently enough so he needed something to get him going oh but Femi's going to be interesting because Burnley are obviously absolutely flying they're heading back to the Premier League uh, you can't imagine Vincent Company's going to make huge changes to his team between now and the end of the season when they're playing so well and Ashley Barnes leads the line for them and Michael Obafemi is a, a very different man uh, size wise certainly from a, an Ashley Barnes so I wonder is there a possibility he plays him a bit deeper if he is to get some game time which again may not be the worst thing for Ireland or maybe he'll just have to put up with being a bench option for the remainder of this season hope there's some injuries and get himself in a place where at the start of next season he can push for a place in a in a Premier League side which would be brilliant but it was a great poacher's goal last night obviously maintained their unbeaten run they didn't uh, maintain their winning run but yeah, Obafemi, he has he has a little bit of an X factor about him. Yeah. He's just lacked any sort of consistency at club level of, you know, he comes in, makes a big impression and then it just struggles to keep it going. Who's starting for you at the moment up front for Ireland against France? I know it's a what, five, six weeks away still, but uh, Ferguson anyways, and if you could find a way of getting Ferguson and Obafemi together, I would I would go with the two of them. I think they're probably well ahead of Paris. That's exciting when you say it out loud, isn't it? It yeah, is, it is, excited? but I, absolutely we're getting too excited like we're talking about Michael Obafemi on the bench for a championship side yeah. going up against <laughs> a, <laughs> Rafael Varane well not anymore he's retired no, of course, sorry, but, up, uh, Meccano, up it? against Super Meccano and yeah. Canate or something along that if yeah. Canate is not injured but yeah I think it definitely feels like a more exciting period for young Irish strikers but they have to actually go and do it on a consistent period like we've been waiting for Michael Obafemi for four years at this stage to really do it consistently at club level he scored some brilliant goals for Ireland internationally but mm. again stay fit get a run of games and let's see where we are in a few months time yeah exciting jeez I can't wait I, I, I know we're starting the build up quite early but I mean we're already talking about the Rugby World Cup later this year so and the Women's World Cup as well in, in Australia so let us let us enjoy it let us start it Nathan great stuff as always this morning thanks a million uh, Cheers, yeah. O2BM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day on tomorrow's show, we'll have Graham Hunter, we'll have Jasmine Baba's tactical breakdown of Arsenal Man City, as we said tonight at the Emirates, half past seven kickoff for that game. Sue Ronan will be our latest guest on our You Had to Be There, and plenty more besides. Right now, we'll bring you Dan McDonald from last night's football show. And uh, I was hoping this would be a Godfather quote, but uh, Colm has provided me with this quote to leave you with for the rest of your Wednesday. If you can achieve just one thing, just one thing today, can it be that you all have an amazing day? Thanks a mil. See you tomorrow. Mick is hanging on with us uh, in Forcing the background. He's been in the studio for the whole night today. Uh, it's true. And Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent is here in the studio. Good evening, Daniel. It's good, yeah. Uh, so, Liverpool last night, Monday Night Football, I went home after the show and I thought, well, I'll watch the abbreviated highlights, which are nicely condensed half hour on Sky Sports in the early hours of the morning. And I hadn't fully appreciated being on air and, and not keeping an eye on things too closely. Uh, Liverpool, for the first time, Look like a side with energy. 
I don't know why this has happened, um, but this was a Liverpool who, at times, for certain goals, had that old devastating speed again and energy again. I thought, my goodness, uh, what has happened here? Now, you burst my bubble just there by saying... They played Everton. It's Everton. <laughs> uh, but I, I think Everton notwithstanding, this was a major swing back to something approaching Liverpool energy levels. Jordan Henderson looked like the Jordan Henderson of old. From minute one, he was just fired up. And there was a speed... The, Salah, who's been so iffy for so long, I thought he was kind of electric again. You know, really dangerous again. Uh, Nunes is Nunes. I mean, he has so many good things but he will inevitably miss the chances. And there was one where I, I, I tried to curl it into the far right corner. It wasn't a difficult angle. It's, it's almost become routine in this era of the Premier League to score those chances. And I mean, he sent it comfortably wide. So he remains an issue, I suppose. Uh, Stefan Bacitek in uh, midfield, who was playing under 18s football last season. Carragher gave him man of the match. I mean, he did catch the eye. And if there's one thing Jordan Henderson wants around him, it's not Thiago. It's young legs, and this guy was like tenacious. So I put it to you, Dan. This was uh, potentially, potentially, uh, turning a point in the road because I just haven't seen them with this energy and this kind of zest at all this season. Oh, you're falling into a major trap here. <laughs> this is like trap. Like this is it is set out in front of you, and it's like nah. Like I mean, and. I mean, I, I, recently enough, like I would have been saying here, Liverpool still definitely finishing the top four. I'm like, I'm not believing the whole thing is broken or or cracked or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that last night to me doesn't reflect any kind of major turning point at all. Like, you know, it's a Monday night derby against your rivals with a new manager, bit of spice between the managers in the past. I mean, Liverpool are a far better side than Everton. Like Everton are down the bottom of the table. I mean, Eric, earlier this season, like Liverpool turned on the style, beat what knocked nine past Bournemouth in one game or whatever. Like what you see sometimes with these like big teams, like that are having bad seasons, they will have these these performances they produce where they look like themselves. But mm. what's killed Liverpool is application. I mean, energy is fine; it's one thing, but it's actually just like application. Like, they concede early goals in games, like. You know, I think people find that they've struggled because of their energy and then there's a game where they're energetic and it's like, well, this is clearly, they've reached some kind of point in the road here. But for me, what Liverpool is just more, like, what's what's happening if you're starting games so badly all the time? That can't be just put down to energy. There's, there's something more of a breakdown and a fault there. And a big, memorable Anfield night where the crowd is really pumped up for, for it because it's your rivals, mm. to me, doesn't sort of represent... I mean, the first goal, right, was a scintillating breakaway but I mean, it is worth pointing out that like Everton did hit the post from close range and I mean they could have scored from the follow up and the, that was from a corner after a little bit of pressure could completely change the mm. tone of the evening mm. so um, yeah I like Nunes actually I think <laughs> I, I know he's, his erratic streak is clearly there to see but he's definitely got attributes that can you know I think in his second season yeah. I think over time I wouldn't be given up hope against them um, but uh, there was obviously parts of Everton they felt they could attack and, and cause problems but really now nah, I'll believe it I'll believe it when they're going away from home on a sort of a you know two three games in a row and they're doing the same thing and uh, then I'll sort of declare some kind of corner turn I wouldn't Perhaps be a huge amount into it away from home this Saturday to Newcastle which is That's now Champions one. League uh, six-pointer. Uh, I, I take all your points. I take all your points. But genuinely, I haven't seen them play at this speed or with this kind of uh, zest in a very long time. Again, Henderson making challenges. All of them making channel, cha challenges. Uh, the Terkowski header, definitely a sliding doors moment. And it would have been interesting to see if they'd responded. But... Uh, uh, yeah, I thought it was incredibly striking. They just haven't played this pace before. Jurgen Klopp addressed this afterwards in the press conference. So here's Klopp talking to journalists about uh, a much better Liverpool. We can agree on if whether it's if it's for a night or more sustained, we'll find out. I'm in love with our crowd, and um, what they did tonight, um, I was very special to be honest, and um, and it was just extremely helpful. The boys paid back, um, and so it was a really a real derby, difficult opponent to play against, but we played the game we wanted to play and um, not the game Everton wanted to play. And What's the key to that? Keeping the ball, switching the, oh, sorry, switching the sides, um, 
um, staying patient but finding direction, um, get into behind, get into behind the line um, of them. Even that's because they they try to hold the 18 yard line, and so we, timing was not perfect. We had a few offside moments there, but the idea was good and. Um, being there, I saw I saw a, a real unit tonight, uh, where everybody was fighting, um, really, really fighting, and so, and the goals we scored were two sensational counter attacks. To be honest, can you remember a situation when we had last time that many options in a counter attack for the guy who had the ball? I can't. So tonight we were there, and that has to be, that has to be um, now the sign for us what we have to do. Um, and even when you're in a game like this, like they're really dominant. I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I think we had 70% probably around um, the ball, but scored two goals from counter attack, and that makes it really special. Does that first goal, I mean, obviously we don't know what the future holds, but does it feel like it might be a transformative moment? You could go 1-0 down, despite playing well, you could go 1-0 down, yeah. 18 seconds later, it's in there now. Yeah, absolutely. So we, 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 we thought the same. Well, we thought the same because last week it was the first ball coming in, deflected goal, um, and it obviously gives the game a direction. There's no no doubt about that. It should not be that impactful, but it still happens from time to time. And so yes, it was uh, the biggest difference I would say between other games and tonight. But I really thought. Um, the performance for the full 95, 96 minutes was the best for a while as well, and um, so that's what we we we, we would we would wins as we take wins as well when you don't play well. Um, that happens not often, but from time to time. But it's much better to to get three points when you when you deserve it really, and tonight we deserved it. Jurgen Klopp there, not playing it down, not playing down the quality on show at times. I think he's right not to. This was different. Mark my words, Dan. Don't text I don't me know. I, <laughs> I just think like I, I see your point, but I think a more savvy team would. He's talking about the options for the the counter attacks for the first goal. A more savvy team cuts that off at source pretty quickly. Probably like Seamus Coleman got sucked into it there, but um, I'm not sure if Newcastle would leave themselves exposed in Probably that not. manner to that type of break. So I don't know. Like the Everton sat as as a rival, um, sort of uh, sort of bequeaths the game with a bit of an importance. You know, if they were playing, who's on similar points to Everton? If they were Liverpool playing at home to them and beat them that way, would you be finding I, do you know, a I, huge I, amount out of it? I would because of the speed and the energy and that sense of cohesion. Because Everton, if nothing else under Deitch, will work hard and will be fired up, as Arsenal found out. Like, I thought in advance of this game, Liverpool's need was great for sure. But there was something about a fired up, motivated, hard-working Everton that could oppose them problems if they were in any way flat again and flat has been their basic modus operandi all season so the fact that they came out and matched it and, and like they broke everything I thought with their energy which again is just the Liverpool of two three years ago yeah I don't know I just didn't I didn't see you're, that you're making like, me go further now I, than I want to yeah you're the you're very like Liverpool could they win the league they are going to win everything but I, I don't know I think again it's like well Everton there you go They're, Everton had the bounce for that Arsenal game they were very good but like they're where they are for a reason too. It's difficult to sustain the bounce to like you know to, to a sort of a to a point where it becomes the norm. Mm. You're just in the door, and maybe they're a very good opponent for actually Liverpool at the moment. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Next week we could be here talking about how Liverpool went to Newcastle and did a number on them, and and they're back in the game. Um, not so sure. <laughs> uh, Kingsley Coman has scored the opener for Bayern Munich. They are 1-0 up against PSG in Paris, 57 minutes in the clock. Uh, as soon as the goal went in after celebrations, the camera cut immediately to Kylian Mbappe taking off his top. He's now on, yeah. They're saying, get out there, yeah. rescue us for the love of God. World Cup final style. <laughs> yeah, well, he's on. He's already created a bit of danger. Donnarumma was really bad for the PSG goal. Um, it just went under him. You know, one of those that was a little bit too close to him. And it just went under his body. Suchek really would have saved it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, back page, by the way, just uh, on Liverpool for another moment. The back page, for instance, of the London Times here, remarkable that no one lost their life. This UEFA commissioned report, it's an independent panel, but it's commissioned by UEFA on the back of Stade de France last year. Uh, initially, when I saw this report had been published, I thought, well, we kind of know all we need to know about this situation. But some of the language used uh, within is frightening and UEFA are 100% culpable in 
every way. It, it's just the most damning report. So again, that headline, it's remarkable that no one lost their life. Uh, this really could have been so dangerous. Uh, for instance, the report says, the dangerous conditions on the concourse outside the turnstiles compounded by the police deploying tear gas at disorderly groups of locals, as well as using pepper spray and supporters trying to gain entrance with the valid tickets. It is remarkable no one lost their life. Uh, UEFA, it turns out, delegated safety and security and policing duties. You'd sort of think with organisations the size of UEFA that just there'd be a degree of, if not best practice, things would be done reasonably well. And then it just turns out it's shambolic behind the scenes. UEFA sought to insulate itself from anything that went wrong. In doing so, it removed its own safety and security unit from a vital role to monitor and supervise and join together the various efforts and to troubleshoot all problems. Uh, so the report says that's wholly unacceptable. And it says inside as well, and it's kind of interesting, back when the Stade de France held that 06 Champions League final, I think that was the Arsenal-Barcelona one famously, mm. Back when it held the Champions League final in 06, there were issues there and the UEFA reported after the match that there had been serious problems, including failures with police and there were access problems. So this ground had proved tricky for them the last time they were there. And Martin Callan is named. He was involved then. He's still involved now as uh, chief executive of UEFA events. He comes in for massive uh, criticism. And also, and this is important to note, given that you know we're talking about Man City not cooperating with investigations, they say Martin Callan's account of what occurred was seriously flawed and it contained assertions that were objectively untrue. In effect, UEFA lied to us in their own mm. commissioned investigation. It's a miracle no one died. Nothing to do with the fans. There were not fans turning up with no tickets. And I wonder what the consequences of this will be. Yeah, I think it, and I think it was discussed somewhere as well that I mean, delaying kickoff it was sort of Seferin sort of making a making a call on it. Like you know, how how uh, again? And you see, I'm, I'm maybe thinking more of FIFA in terms of certain aspects of, of maybe generalising big sporting football bodies, but you sort of assume because of the layers of people that work for them and, and the sort of the size of the organisation and UEFA, like it's a sort of, you, you mentioned them in a story and it sort of bestows importance on it, UEFA, that these are like these slick, well-oiled operations that are, you know, that that are, that, that, that every decision is sort of uh, thought through in great detail and, and they operate like, you know, with thorough professionalism at all times and Fortunately, like I mean, they're they're in many cases like they're very vulnerable to to errors and um, disorganisation and and whatever it might be. I mean, UEFA a lot of the times. I mean, you know, the decision making around where they bring finals and competitions. You know, for you know, it's often you know it's not necessarily driven by well this will be the best venue for the supporter experience it can be you know well, which has got layers of corporate hospitality yeah. you know which can which can satisfy certain criteria to hit targets um, and this was commercial the targets. final taken off St. Petersburg as yeah. well so maybe the leading time was uh, short I do have a clip here from a Professor Clifford Stott so he co-authored this report. It's an independent uh, review. And for instance, he talked here about Liverpool fans and it seems they're life-saving actions. Crushes developed that were potentially fatal. And it was the ability of Liverpool football fans to recognise the dangers that were being faced by themselves and others and to organise collectively to address those challenges that helped people avoid death. Had that not happened, we believe that we would have been looking at a stadium disaster where people would have died. And it really is sad that we live in a situation where people fall back on stereotypical views of, of football fans in general um, that allows for this idea that somehow football fans are to blame for these problems. It's partly those lazy stereotypes that lead us into circumstances like those that we experienced in Paris, and no football fan should believe that they're immune from circumstances like that developing around them. So that's Professor Clifford Stott, he co-authored the report. I think fans do generally go to games and think in 2020 
two as it was then, they are immune from these kind of disasters and they came perilously close. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose in Qatar there was a lot of issues with tickets and, and handling of, of access to games and, I mean, there was um, okay, very slightly different, I mean, completely different in some ways, but there was obviously a very serious incident at the African Cup of Nations last year where you know, people passed away, so... Um, it, it 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 can happen, but again, like it's the Champions League final, you, you sort of think that this is how we talk about the Champions League is like you know in a footballing sense, mm. we'll speak of it as the cream of everything, you know, and, and you sort of assume that the operations around the final will will match that, um, and it's not the case. I mean, and and like maybe it's it's always easy to to sound very wise about it in hindsight, right after it's a disaster, um, or you know a near disaster. Yeah. But I mean, the Stade de France, there's people, a lot of people, Irish people here listening would have gone and attended the Stade de France. It's not actually a pleasant experience no. to, to go there. You know, it's getting out there after it's the game, nuisance. getting out of it is very difficult, mm. hugely complicated, which creates a lot of stress for people. And, and um, you know, even get, getting there isn't always straightforward, even though it's not a million, it's only a couple of stops from, you know, Gare de Nord, but it's, it's, it's messy, yeah, you know. It and, um, you, you, clearly, for there's there's a certain prestige and a standing and the size of the venue or whatever it is. There's got a bit of a you know, in recent football history, it's a venue that carries a lot of symbolism. Um, but um, as you've mentioned, like they've delegated elements of the um, you know the, the the organization to local authorities in such a way that they they were unfit for purpose. And it's obviously very emotive for a lot of reasons. This naturally the involvement of Liverpool and and with their history and, and what it means almost to be again in some ways um, cast as as culpable in some way, even in just some of the discourse around the story at the time. Um, it it's adds another layer to the depth of feeling and, and the sort of horror around that. And to be fair, there would have been some reporting at the time of the night, which was pretty important in terms of you know outlining no, no, this is this is what's happening. You know what? Like, if we didn't live in a, again, a sort of a, the, I mean, the social media age where a lot of stuff could be captured by people on their phones. Like, in a, at a different point in history, do you rely on the official version of events for for longer? <coughs> um, yeah, does it survive true. for longer? At least the only good thing is that within a very short-ish period of time, yeah, it's been, um, it's been pretty clearly laid out what's happened. Uh, shame is a heavy emotion, Dan. No one wants to walk around with shame. But Pep Guardiola has been, so he mm. uh, initiated his press conference ahead of the Arsenal game tomorrow by saying there was something he wanted to say. I think most people have heard this clip at this stage, but here is Pep and uh, his apology to Stephen Gerrard. Before I start the press conference, I want to say something. Um, I apologise to Stephen Gerrard for my unnecessary and the stupid comments I said the last time about uh, him. He knows how I admire him and uh, his career, what he has done for, for this country that I am living in training session. I am training, I am a shape of myself, what I said because he doesn't deserve it. I truly believe my, my comments, what I said uh, in my previous conference about I defend my club but uh, I didn't represent my club well, uh, putting his name in this stupid comment. So I apologize, I said to him personally, but like I comment publicly, I have to do it here as well. So I'm so sorry for him, from Alex, his wife, kids, family, because uh, it was stupid. A range of takes on this apology. I'm not, I'm not gonna, all I want to know is all I want to know is what prompted that. I'm not going to ask a leading question. Go on. All I want to know is what prompted that apology. You don't think a sincere moment of oh, why would I bring Stephen Jared into this? God, I was emotional. It was silly. I must apologize. That for is that. That, I, that is perhaps true, but he, it may have. I would imagine. Actually, I, don't, I have no reason for saying this. My opinion would be that must have been brought to his attention somewhere, somehow. That it had that become. You've, you've a gone thing. a little bit far here, mm. and then I would say. He he felt that shame and felt the need to like reference, you know, his his wife, his family. Mm. But that's a, whether he what he said wasn't. I mean, it, was, it wasn't he just, that bad. He just referenced the the slip. Like, yeah, I was more know. I was more offended by the lack of logic to it. But you talk uh, about like a penalty miss of someone in the past. Like it's something that happened. Yeah, it's. I mean, again, it's like it is the focus to, of to a me, song like, that taunts uh, the man at every. Yeah, turn. that's true. 
but it's like it's um it's almost like you know you there's a golden circle of like elite performers here and you know you don't if you're in that club the first rule of the club is like don't disrespect anyone well, no, else game respects game in that club. But, so but, I'd whether, love to know okay, is but there some connection is there a third party is there is there a shared sure. agency or people that are sort of pushing those buttons but, but, so you but, have to go and go far in this apology whether it was prompted by his own self-reflection or somebody saying Pep you don't do this come on either way I would take the apology as sincere I thought the way he delivered it was sincere no Mick thinks it's all a giant charade. We've been through this on a slight tangent. <laughs> been through it twice tonight. I don't know. Like, I don't, don't really really care. Yeah. Like, do you know, like, like in the sense that, exactly. like, like a lot of the, you know, the the lead managers, what makes them best is like the ability to be, have a sort of a, I don't know, to be narcissistic in some ways and just see everything through their own eyes and nothing else matters. And sometimes we want to we want to attach feelings to them because that would make us feel better about yes, this is. You know, warmth to their character. Like, I guess what I'm saying is, if he'd had a go at some uh, <coughs> championship level <coughs> footballer, you know, or had a spat with a manager at championship level and had a go at him, would he come out and do things in the same way? Why did he feel the need to? To me, I, and that to me colors my view on the sincerity of the apology. And also, the sincerity. thing is, just because, sorry, Vic, yeah. No, sorry, but it's just to your point about not caring. It's like we're talking all night about. Pep Guardiola's apology to Steven Gerrard, rich famous man apologised to the rich yeah. famous man having insulted him. Like, both of his press conferences, it's far more important this position he's taking on Manchester City's alleged wrongdoings. Yeah. And the I, charges brought against him by the Premier League, but we're all obsessing over Steven Gerrard. You know, yeah, that, that's yeah. why it doesn't matter. Like, yeah, I'm but I, like, I mean, I'm not like, against yeah, I'm sorry, the, I brought the, it up the subject being brought up. <laughs> like, it's just, God's sake, I God. just think it's like, it's, it's soap opera. It's classic Premier League soap opera where it's just, you know, Again, it's it's sort of people. It sort of stirs emotions, but it's just honestly, I just who cares. Like, you know, like in the right man for this show. Let's move on. <laughs> uh, we'll take a short break. Bayern are one 0 up against PSG. So, despite Neymar's introduction, the flow of traffic is still very much towards the uh, PSG goal. And then Spurs in Milan. Very latest is it was one 0 to AC Milan. Still one 0 it's still 1-0. Thank you, Michael. That goal coming on seven minutes. Diaz with the goal on seven minutes in this game. Uh, no goal since. So 1-0 in both games to Milan and to Bayern. Uh, we'll take a short break. Uh, we will chat about the fortunes of Nathan Collins, Gambazunu. We will talk about the Liam Brady documentary and a few other bits and pieces. Back in one minute. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. 